And we return to the consideration stage of the Welfare Reform Bill and the second group of amendments for debate. And I call Mr Alec Atwood. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm inclined to say, um, speaking to a packed and hushed chamber surrounded by his party colleagues, but clearly the, la clearly the latter point isn't correct, even if the former point is more correct. <laughs> the, the, um, I gave them the morning off, Minister. Or they said they didn't want to listen to me any longer, and you can make your choices there. <laughs> um, uh, the, there was one point that uh, did strike me yesterday when the, the Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, said that um, this all comes down to people. And my variation on that uh, story is that the Anderson Town News uh, last month reported that the first food bank in West Belfast is shortly to open. And those are the sort of uh, facts and experience um, that uh, I think uh, should inform how we approach today. And I would say to the Minister um, that uh, I'm inclined to talk about uh, ministers who are in government and those who are in power. And there's a big difference between the two. And the Scottish Nationalist uh, ministers demonstrate, together with my colleague to my left, demonstrates those who know the difference between being in government and being in power. And I think that today, Minister, um, uh, given that there, everybody knows there's a new broom in DSD, and I'm not going to say much about the previous incumbent, but everybody knows there's a new broom in DSD. And I'd like to see the uh, fingerprints of all of that in how you respond to the amendments today, because it would be no mean achievement if, at the end of today, recognised in our law were victims and survivors, uh, recognised in our law the need to give advice and assistance, uh, recognised in our law what may well be the case on the far side of the Westminster election when it comes to the benefit cap, one of the amendments in this uh, group of motions, um, and that the issue was so important that the Assembly said to itself that it needed to have particular measures of oversight when it comes to welfare now and in the future. Um, and I hope that that uh, will uh, inform how the Minister um, approaches today in terms of amendments that touch upon those issues and many aside. Um, the reason why we have, Mr Speaker, uh, amendments such as the one on the benefit cap in this group is that it is our view that uh, we have not seen the half of it when it comes to welfare reform and what the ambitions of a future Tory government might be when it comes to the benefit cap. Uh, it, it, it is now openly talked about that on the far side of the election the British government is going to try to uh, have further austerity, as they say it, of £30 billion, of which indicatively £12 billion would uh, be the welfare contribution to that austerity budget. And uh, we are saying today, in respect of all our amendments, but in respect of the benefit cap amendment in particular, that uh, we have to anticipate what is going to be the shape of things very soon from now. Uh, if I were to put money on it, and that's more my brother's inclination than my, mine, but if I were to put money on it, um, uh, in the event, at the moment, the Tories are planning uh, what their first strikes will be in the event that they are elected. We know that, if nothing else, from uh, David Cameron's recent co uh, contribution about reducing the benefit cap to 23,000, but it is going to be more than that. Remember what happened after they were elected in May 2011. There was an emergency budget in June 2011 where they made their first slash at welfare, followed by the November paper from uh, the DWP minister uh, where they outlined the ambition of universal credit. And we are heading, Minister, for a replay because it's up in lights already from David Cameron's contribution a few days ago, and that is only the first part of the menu. 
because the tensions in the British government between DWP, Treasury and the Cabinet Office means that I think, without any doubt, the balance of power was always with Treasury, but the political strategy is now going to be defined by Cabinet Office and Treasury, not by DWP. And we need to anticipate what will be the shape of things on the far side of this election, in the first weeks after this election, including potentially what Labour might get up to in terms of where welfare is going. I'll give way. Well, um, you know, I, in many respects, I share some of, of the concerns that he's expressing. And those are the issues that, that I have been endeavouring. Indeed, when Ed Miliband was was in Northern Ireland, I had the opportunity along with the First Minister to have a discussion with him around these issues. In fact, I also uh, intend to be in London at the beginning of the week. So these are issues that I am taking a, a keen interest in, but we have to face reality. And reality is that we are facing, as all the pundits, uh, including your brother, uh, will probably say is the most uh, intriguing election that the United Kingdom has had for many, many years, and one which we cannot determine what the outcome will be. However, my focus has to be to ensure that I have had discussions with uh, the Labour uh, Party and also uh, having discussions with the current government, because I think that is ensuring not that uh, I would use betting parlance, but that is me hedging my bets. <laughs> um, and, and as I said earlier, there is new broom in DSD, and that seems to me to indicate that you at least are thinking um, to the end of next year, whereas maybe your predecessor was thinking about the last century, but we will not, we'll not go there for, for, um, uh, for the moment. Um, but, but given that recognition, when it comes back to the uh, group of amendments, and I am talking to the group of amendments, I can reassure you in that regard, uh, because it is about the benefit cap. And that is why, when I come to it in more detail, that is why the, the amendment about the benefit cap is so important. Because if, if that analysis is right and that there is bad news coming from the Tories if they win, and potentially bad news from the, from the Labour if they win, then I think we need to anticipate where all, where all that um, is going. Um, the, one of the reasons why I say that is that uh, uh, I referred yesterday to an exchange at a Westminster Select Committee between Mark Durkin and Mr Gawke, who is a Treasury Minister. And I'm sorry that Sammy Wilson isn't here because Sammy Wilson was at the hearing. Uh, remarkably quiet he was at the Select Committee hearing, which is why I wanted him to be here so I could inquire. And this is what the reply was to Mark Durkin from Minister Gawke when he probed him upon what might be the approach of London in relation to a heavy stick being used if our, fund, if our uh, funding here in Northern Ireland was on a sustainable basis. And this is relevant to welfare. It's relevant to the benefit cap. So this is what Mark uh, Durkin said. Quote, there is some concern, not just because of the experience on welfare reform, where the block grant was fined unless the Assembly passed a bill that it otherwise would not have wanted to pass. Will the Minister assure us that the judgment that is made on budget sustainability in a couple of years' time will not hinge on the Treasury saying to the Executive, to us, for instance, you do not have a sustainable budget unless you introduce water charges, and so on. To which he says, my approach to looking at the finances of the Northern Ireland Executive as a whole, in their totality, is that they need to be in a sustainable footing. When it comes to public finances, whether in Northern Ireland or in the UK, public finances are the sum of its parts. That is a matter of looking at the totality of public finances, concluding, in terms of how the Treasury will view that in future, I would not go beyond the wording set out in the Stormont House Agreement. He did not take the opportunity, Minister, to say that in the future, be it on welfare or budget or corporation tax, which is what he was talking about in the context of the Select Committee, he would not rule out the fact that if Northern Ireland's public finances, in the view of the Tories, was not on sustainable footing, 
then there wouldn't be a big stick waved in our faces once again, as we've experienced over the last two years. So we're getting early warning, in my view, from London about how they're going to look at this place when it comes to how we administer our business, be it the budget, corporation tax or welfare, which is a reason why we should try to build into our primary legislation the protections that I urged upon you earlier about uh, 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 independent advice uh, or about the benefit cap or about uh, other aspects referred to the amendments, including uh, naming the issue of victims and survivors on the face of the bill. Um, uh, let's be very clear about this, and, and this is the final general point I want to make, Mr. Speaker. Let's be very, very clear about this. Um, universal credit is coming to a shuddering halt, and Cabinet and Treasury know it, and they will now take control of it. Um, and the consequences of that, as we said yesterday, is more penalties and more cuts to the welfare baseline, including the benefit cap. And it will be more than 23,000, because that won't cut it for David Cameron if he's re-elected. certainly won't cut it uh, for, for George Osborne if he continues to be uh, Chancellor. So that's the context, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker in which, in which uh, 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 this, this matter has to be, has to be considered. Um, as somebody once wrote uh, uh, just a, a few months ago, so the next Secretary of State, DWP, will have a lot of problems on their plate. Cut your losses and cancel universal credit or press ahead despite the risks. Even more difficult will be dealing with the administrative chaos in the disability benefit system angry claimants, disgruntled staff, a contractor who wants to escape as quickly as possible, and mounting costs for taxpayers. And looming over the department is the post-election spending review. Welfare will be firmly in Treasury sites again. That's why we should put in the face of the bill some of the amendments that have been coming uh, from Mr Agnew, from the Ulster Unionists, and, and from ourselves. Uh, could I also then uh, speak uh, in particular around um, uh, a number of the amendments uh, where I would urge uh, the Minister to, uh, to consider further. Uh, he's aware of the two amendments that have been tabled in relation to independent uh, advice and independent advice and assistance. And I think there is a difference. And uh, 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 whilst we'll work with the old students in this regard, we think our amendment, because it refers to the issue of assistance, is uh, also very important. But could I explain our thinking? Because I have a sense that the Minister's mind is not as close as a petition of concern might suggest. <laughs> Maybe put it that if that's not uh, too cryptic or generous. And therefore, uh, I would encourage him uh, uh, over the course of the next while, in response to this matter, uh, uh, maybe in indicating where his thinking might be generally in terms of further consideration stage on this and other matters. So what is it this about? Um, this is, I, I acknowledge that there are a lot of good people giving a lot of good advice in-house within the Social Security Agency, child support and so on and so forth. I'm not in denial of that. Uh, you know, some people suggest that when you gather together all the money that is going into that pot, be it in-house and in the independent sector, it might be four or five million pounds. So that's a very significant uh, contribution. Uh, and to be fair, it, it tracks back to the days of direct rule and then worked itself through both SDLP and DUP social development ministers. Um, so whatever the tensions may be in the budget, what even, whatever the tensions may be within the independent advice sector, but I won't go there, um, the, the, and nonetheless, the, the government has shown some level of good authority when it comes to funding uh, independent and in-house. More in-house than independent, but nonetheless. Um, but this is, this is the argument, and it comes back, Minister, to the fact that if you give all the assistance to the claimant, then you can maximise the benefits of the claimant, reduce the risk of a negative assessment, avoid it going to appeal, um, and at the end of it, 
uh, the quality and experience of the life of the claimant and their family is going to be that much more different. If we can uh, front load that in order to maximise that journey to the right outcome, then I think we should take the uh, uh, opportunity. Um, the, the, the briefing I'm going to borrow from is the Northern Ireland Advice Services Consortium briefing. So this is not um, uh, uh, a stand-alone uh, advice agency. This is the consortia of uh, people who give independent advice, um, who, who refer to the fact that advisors interview people, help the person prioritise the problems, provide up-to-date advice about available benefits, help complete applications, advocate at appeals if necessary, help people liaise with government departments, refer external forms of appropriate crisis intervention. And I would put it to the Minister that the scale of that is greater than the good work that's done within uh, the welfare offices, um, because inevitably they are more constrained than taking an expansive and inclusive approach to advice giving, as is outlined in those seven approach. And what it does is uh, empowers claimants to resolve their own issues, maximises income by promoting benefit uptake, which is currently one of Northern Ireland's main priorities. Remember what your predecessor said, um, uh, Minister, quote, in, uh, in um, 2000, in, sorry, in um, October 2013, he said, my vision, quote, is that every individual and household across Northern Ireland is receiving all social security benefits to which they and their families are entitled. And what that will mean is that it reduces poverty, it benefits local communities, it reduces social exclusion. And these are not just mean, war meaningless words, they are proven in empirical evidence that that is the consequence of maximising benefit uptake and having a good customer journey through the benefits uh, uh, system. Um, it improves the quality uh, of decision making, so there will be less complaints to our offices about what is going on in the various offices, and it helps clients uh, avoid stressful uh, crisis interviews. Um, one estimate in a paper from the Citizens Advice Bureau, and I think this is the Citizens Advice Bureau in Britain and Northern Ireland, not just here in Northern Ireland, is that one pound invested in welfare advice has eight pounds eighty potential savings to the state. Because you can imagine in terms of health and mental support and all the rest of it, that is the consequence of independent advice and uh, 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 assistance. And as I indicated yesterday to Mr. Beggs in an intervention, we are already showing some good authority in that regard. This, our own chamber legislated in uh, the Housing Amendment Act in 2010, I think I actually put that through the House, uh, that every person in Northern Ireland has the right to access free advice about homelessness and preventing homelessness. So we have already opened the door on statutory advice. And the door is wide open, and rightly so, when it comes to other areas of public service, namely when it comes to a, a person uh, being questioned about a criminal offence, they have the right to free legal advice under PACE. And a person who is detained under mental health powers can access legal advice further to a European <coughs> court decision, Winterrup and the Netherlands, uh, where uh, that is further reflected in our draft mental health capacity bill, which con contains a specific right to independent advocacy. So my argument is, in the, in the backdrop of where we are on welfare reform and in the foreground of what might happen on the far side of the election, whoever is elected over there, and uh, 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 when you indicated earlier, talking to everybody, I just refer in passing to the fact that Channel 4 recently said two weeks ago that the balance park had come down to the SDLP MPs and put a big logo up to advertise the fact by a very shrewd political analysis uh, a, a commentator on Channel 4 News who is very familiar with this part of the world. Um, so um, in passing, I'd make that point as well. This is what they conclude. What difference will a statutory right to advice make? Quote, we are mindful that accessing independent advice might become increasingly difficult in the future not least in light of the Department of Justice proposal to remove welfare benefits in the scope of legal aid. Therefore, by making a commitment now to uh, create a statutory right to advice, the Department for Social Development will be providing assurance to all those who may be adversely affected by welfare reform, 
claimants will be supported in making decisions and choices about their benefits. So I'd urge the Minister to uh, consider, uh, to consider uh, uh, those, those uh, matters uh, in, in, um, in going forward. Uh, could I then uh, return to the issue of our amendment on, on, on the benefit cap? Um, and what we are saying at the heart of it, and this is probably in terms of cost and in terms of the principle of parity, which I always said that uh, we should stretch the limits of, um, and then on occasions went unilateral in breaking it, um, in respect of not taping regulations, although I suspect that once I was out of office, someone somewhere in the department rectified that. I've never been able to actually clarify who, who failed to follow my best advice. But in any case, this is the point we're trying to make, that in the context of, of the backdrop uh, uh, of uh, London's ambitions on welfare and how that might work itself through, and how that might impact in terms of the benefit cap. Um, we are saying that caring benefits should be exempt. And we know that of all our amendments, this might have some consequences in terms uh, of, uh, of, um, of uh, 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 cost, but we would ask that there's some mind applied to the issue that it should apply that the benefit cap should not apply to child benefit carers allowance and benefits caring, benefits caring responsibilities um, because uh, we do not think in any circumstances that vulnerable young people, vulnerable children and vulnerable adults should be at the front line of what might, be next, what might next happen and that we should anticipate and legislate accordingly against all of that. Um, could I then just refer to some other amendments? Um, my colleague Mrs Kelly uh, uh, spoke to Amendment 2, which is a minimum change but has a good benefit in reducing the waiting day provision from seven to three days. Um, on Amendment 28, uh, we have had some conversations with the Minister and uh, 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 if he says what I anticipate, he will say will not be inclined to move that amendment. In terms of our opposition to 61 and 63, uh, there has been advice received uh, in the past from the Law Centre and the Northern Ireland Centre for Ethnic Minorities. And if I give you an example of what the concern might be, if there is somebody in Northern Ireland who has been given uh, um, permission to remain, leave to remain, and is therefore uh, entitled, has been entitled to work and is working, and then the leave to remain is withdrawn, they will have contributed to the state, but they may not be able to access benefits. This is one of the issues that has been raised. So in the circumstances where there's been a contributing person who has been entitled to work, whose circumstances change, where they're not entitled to work, but where they have yet to leave the state. Um, is the welfare system, in terms of clauses 61, 62 and 63, and the benefits named therein, is the system going to accommodate those people in terms of getting uh, assistance? Uh, because we do think that there is uh, some issues around social security law and European requirements um, in that regard. Um, thank you. Um, could I then move to the issue of the bedroom tax? And I say that Mr. Wilson is uh, still uh, not in, uh, in the chamber. And uh, he, with some encouragement from people to my right, uh, tried to sustain an argument in the House last night that uh, the opposition to the bedroom tax is uh, uh, in somehow less than uh, fulsome and honest on the behalf of the SDLP because weren't we um, the people who brought the, benef who brought, uh, the, uh, the uh, bedroom tax into, into Northern Ireland? 
Um, I'll find the words in a second that has been used by, by Mr Wilson last night, where, where he said, and I quote him, I, I noticed the pseudo-anger that we had from the SDLP on this issue, maybe from other people. For example, they upbraided Sinn Féin on the refusal to sign a petition to concern the spare room subsidy, ignoring the fact that the spare room subsidy was introduced into Northern Ireland by the SDLP. Um, what he was, of course, referring to was a piece of legislation that this House passed in 2007, a Welfare Reform Act, which addressed the issue of local housing allowance, not for people in the housing executive sector, not for people in the housing association sector, not for people uh, where they were getting housing support from health and social services, from a charity or a voluntary organisation, from none or any of those sectors. It was in respect of the local housing allowance for the private rented sector. And there is no provision, no provision for a bedroom tax in the law that was passed, I'll give you a second, in 2007. What was that law uh, meant to do? It was to regulate the private rented sector. And why shouldn't it be regulated? Because if there's landlords out there profiteering, especially at the height of the property market, by increasing rents in a disproportionate way to either the quality of the property or for the rental market in that area, is it not right for us to legislate to put constraints on the private rented sector and, and I will, on, on the private rented sector? So regulating the private rented sector to the benefit of the tenant and the state and not to the benefit of profiteering landlords is not a bedroom tax. Um, what the legislation did was put down, and this has been updated on a regular basis by the housing executive, establish and identify uh, rental market areas in Northern Ireland um, so that there was a template against which to judge market rental uh, for private properties in each of those areas because clearly rental uh, properties and prices uh, vary depend upon the sections of the Northern Ireland with the intention of delivering affordable social rents to make it fairer or less confusing, to remove unjustified differences between areas and within areas in order to have a rental regime that try to create a similar uh, rental for similar properties in similar areas. That's not a bedroom tax by any description. A give way. I thank uh, the member for giving way. I did say when I got up with the minister give way, but Mickey reminded me that that was a while ago in, in the terms. But uh, what, what I would say is that, now remember the debate very well uh, in the round uh, the introduction of the local housing alliance. And we had raised a number of uh, issues, and I think it may have been with Margaret Ritchie at the time uh, at committee. <laughs> and we had raised the fact that uh, there, will, there, there will be quite a number of people who will lose out, who will have to pay more. And a, a lot of them would be within his own constituency of West Belfast, and some of them were impoverished areas. And uh, what, what it did do, uh, it, uh, it meant that people were paying more money for poor conditions, where they had to make a tap up on money that they had to borrow. So uh, the, the, I think you're picking nits when you talk about uh, the, the difference between the bedroom tax and what people were forced to pay extra in terms of uh, the local housing allowance. You know, I'm surprised by that contribution because for the last two years we've been talking about the bedroom tax. And what is the bedroom tax? It is saying to somebody in a rental property, you, uh, you have to get out of it. And if you're staying there, you'll have to pay a punitive price for so doing. That's, that's the bedroom tax in law, and everybody knows what that means. Regulation of a previously not properly fully regulated market when it came to private property is, is, a, far, I will, is a far different creature from that. If you were so concerned that this was the precursor for the bedroom tax, as you and Sammy Wilson now, uh, uh, in a pseudo way, pretend that it is, then why didn't you petition at that time to block it? If you thought that this was going to be the door that opened penalties on tenants across Northern Ireland, 
in the private sector, in the housing executive sector, in the housing association sector, in every sector. Why did you not petition? You were right. You were right to name concerns. And you were did, did, sorry, did you even did you even come and ask anybody? Like Mr Wilson is now saying that the precursor of the precursor of the of the property tax was two thousand and seven. You didn't need our votes in 2007. All you needed was two or three Sammy Wilsons. <laughs> so, so you, did you go? Did you go? Order, order. Can I ask that all remarks be directed to the chair and no remarks from a sedentary position? Um, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, so, so you didn't call it the bedroom tax. You didn't try to petition against the bedroom tax. You didn't go and approach Sammy Wilson, who was so concerned about it being the precursor for the bedroom tax, that he would have willingly joined you in opposition to what Margaret Ritchie was trying to do. Thank the member for giving me. What I would say is trying to defend the indefensible, because what you're, you're trying to give the impression that the private rental sector is regulated. It is not. We have been arguing since 2007 for the regulation of the private rental sector. A private landlord can charge whatever they want. What the local housing allowance did was it meant that people who are on subsistence level and benefit ended up paying 20 and 25 pound and 30 pound out of their benefit. So don't try and defend the indefensible and put it out at something it simply is not. Well, a number of comments. I see that the member now doesn't use the word bedroom tax. Yeah, well, you and your colleagues and colleagues across the chamber last night were on multiple occasions using the bedroom tax, the precursor for the bedroom tax. In fact, there was one moment, it was a precious moment, when Sammy Wilson gave way, I think it was to Mr Brady. He gave way to Mr Brady and, and nearly, nearly felt a wee bit embarrassed. But given that they were given common cause, Given that they were had common cause, they thought this was their moment. And as is so often with Mr. Wilson's contributions to debate, uh, his need for theatre gets in the way of the facts. His need for theatre gets in the way of the facts. And, and last night, you were willing accomplices as you tried to claim and pretend that something that was done, that was done uh, with caution, uh, mindful of the risks. Uh, in order to try to create a proper regulatory regime. It, th does the law mean that in every circumstance every tenant is protected from the excesses of what a landlord might do in a situation, Mr. Uh, Deputy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, where, as in other parts of these island, people have to rely upon the private sector uh, more because of austerity budgets? Of which one has recently passed in this, or is about to be passed in this chamber, the best deal possible, we were told, the best deal possible that will see people losing their houses. Why? Because they won't get wage increases. Why? Because they won't have enough childcare support. Why? All the reasons that are inherent in that budget will see people losing their homes, which will result in people being thrown to the private sector and to some of the profiteers that you and I would rightly want to disagree with. So, so don't pretend today that what happened in 2007 is the, is the precursor of the bedroom tax, is the cause of all profiteering that goes on in the private rented sector. When, when, you, when you have a responsibility to mitigate the impact of all of that upon our people and vote through a budget that's the best deal possible. That is, Mr Adams says he wants to lead an anti-austerity government in the South after 2016. After 2016, he wants to lead an anti-austerity. Well, he should come north and see what it is like to lead an austerity, an 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 austerity government. So we'll see what the Irish people have to say Sorry, about, about all of that. So, uh, right, you, see, you see, that's what happens. The, order, the, order. The member must be heard. Can I have no comments from a sedentary position? The, I think the comments actually from a sedentary position always are very revealing, Mr Deputy Speaker. 
And what is revealing about that is how people to my right now rely upon democratic mandate, something that we've never taken away from the people of Ireland. They rely upon democratic mandate in order to beat up on other parties in a situation where they flaunted democratic mandate for 20 and 30 and 40 years, and even in the last day, continue to flaunt democratic mandate by resisting the right of legislatures to bring forward amendments to bill and hide behind petitions of concern in order to ensure that the will of the majority prevails come what may. I think Sinn Féin should look long and hard at their purported claims to want to lead anti-austerity governments when they lead austerity governments in the north, when they claim democratic mandate, which is their right to do because that's the will of the people of Ireland, where they flaunt democratic practice in this chamber, as unfortunately was done for decades on this island at a terrible cost to so many people on this island. I, I didn't hear that one. I wish I had. Yes. Can I ask the member that he address his comments through the chair? Can I ask that there be no remarks from the sedentary position? The, uh, uh, I think my own party leader issued a statement yesterday, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, saying that the party to my right was rattled. When people hear, as they hopefully will be recorded and answered, when people hear that uh, a member of Sinn Féin has said what he has just said in terms of paying for their lives for a democratic mandate, um, when? with their lives. And I recognise that. And I'm not somebody who denies the uh, pain and grief of people within the Republican family. Don't deny it. And uh, acknowledge that as victims and survivors they require their own support. I'll finish this point very quickly, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, but people on this island, people on this island paid a hugely disproportionate price for those who took up arms and may have lost their lives when there was a democratic alternative, when there was a mandate for democratic change, when the violence resisted in election after election by the people of the Ireland, when there was a constitutional alternative, and when the violence only divided our people more and more. I ask the Speaker to come back to the amendment rather than remarks, addressing remarks from the sedentary position. Um, so, so the issue then uh, I was going to talk about was the petition of cons or was about the bedroom tax, and, and could I say this, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that, that it is not too late. Um, Sinn Féin signed the petition of concern the bedroom tax. Uh, uh, they didn't sign the, the way back. They did. No, they didn't. Oh, no, sorry, they got that wrong as well. Sorry. Um, I was getting guidance from. Um, but it's not too late anyway to sign a petition. It's not too late to sign a petition of concern. If you go out that door and turn right, and then turn right again, there's an office called the business office, and in there there's a petition of concern waiting. Uh, and, and you can sign it as well, Minister, if you're if you're so in, so inclined. Um, uh, uh, so that uh, that issue can be more conclusively addressed uh, uh, in the course of of. Uh, of today. Um, and why should it be done is because uh, London knows that the bedroom tax, a bit like universal credit, uh, is dying a slow but painful death because it's painful the people who suffer from it. Uh, it has cost too much. It hasn't had the ambition, it hasn't had the outcome that uh, London intended. Uh, uh, it will be abandoned sooner or later. Labour have already said that. The Liberal Democrats are jumping ship. And the Tories know that uh, the bedroom tax isn't long for this world. And therefore, we would encourage people at this late stage to send out that message to London, to send that message to our people, to honour the words of people in our dash and in statement after statement after statement that the, uh, the bedroom tax is not going to exist in practice or in law in this part. Uh, of, of the world. Um, could I also make a comment, Mr. Speaker, about this claim 
um, that there is some, a four-party deal and a five-party deal. And Mr Brady said he had some document last night. He was waving it. Um, uh, there are certainly documents in the uh, talks down in Stormont. Um, there was no document signed off on until the five parties uh, moved to that conclusion. Uh, and I've checked uh, because I was mystified by what was being claimed. I've checked. With, I checked with other parties. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I was there. And, and I don't know what you're talking about. And other parties in this chamber don't know what you're talking about. So, so I don't understand what this document is. There was documents produced, documents were discussed, documents were interrogated, options A, B and C and C plus were looked at in terms of mitigation and so on and so forth. And I recall that uh, uh, during one of the uh, sessions, I think on the 17th of December, um, our party said that if there was a package of mitigation up to 100 million, we were prepared to look at it. We were raising the issue of the welfare uh, cap, and I want, to raise that, I want to raise that with the Minister in, in a moment. And we began to flag up what the point I made earlier in the debate, that when it comes to the practice of London, when it comes to welfare, waving a stick, and imposing penalty, would it be replicated when it came to corporation tax? I'll give way to the member. Thank the member for giving me. When I raised the subject last night, you seemed very reluctant to, um, when you were given the opportunity to re uh, rebuff what I had said. You seem to have uh, plenty of knowledge now. You see, were there? Did you not remember it from last night, or did it take you all night to think about what was actually happening? Um, well, uh, the Hansard will confirm, uh, to the embarrassment of Mr. Brady, that uh, my colleague, the minister, and my colleague, the deputy leader of the SDLP, both, both asked you on a number of occasions to give way. You declined, and then all of a sudden, uh, your partner in crime <laughs> sorry, I withdraw that remark because that might be uh, inappropriate. Your partner in, in petitions on the far side, you gave way to that member. The first moment he asked to give way, you give way. Yet when Mr. Durkin and Ms. Kelly ask, you decline. Um, so we'd ask uh, people to reflect upon any and all of that. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, could I then move on to, um, to the, uh, the amendment? Is there another amendment that I want to talk to? Just give me a second, please. Um, I don't think that there is. So, uh, to conclude my remarks, as I probably have gone on longer than I anticipated, I would say to the Minister that uh, uh, the points I made at the opening remarks in relation to um, naming in the bill victims and survivors, independent advice and assistance, where we might go in terms of the benefit cap, and so on and so forth. Because, uh, as I was indicating earlier, I do have a question to ask the Minister in respect of the welfare cap. Uh, because this became uh, a major matter of discussion at uh, the uh, Stormont negotiations um, about was there some flexibility that London was giving to us in terms of our notional welfare cap uh, that might accommodate uh, more flexibilities around the administration of universal credit if it ever ends up being administered over here and you know my view on that. So I'd ask the Minister is there some indication of flexibility in terms of what the notional a welfare cap is that might enable uh, things to be done below that threshold, uh, that notional threshold, in a way that actually mitigates the impact of welfare reform beyond anything that is named in any documents that came out of the Stormont negotiations, including uh, the, the five-party understanding. Is there anything uh, in any and all of that regard? I want to conclude with this remark if I may, Mr Speaker, and I think I've probably referred to it here in, 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 um, in the House. Uh, when I was in DSD Minister, the then uh, Dial Minister, uh, Lord Empey, and myself had a meeting with um, Chris Greeling. Chris Greeling is now the Justice Secretary in London, but at that time he was a junior minister in DWP. And uh, uh, from what I understand, Mr Greeling is one of the more dogmatic of the Tory High Command. And he uh, had this conversation with us 
And it is a conversation I think should echo in the ears of everybody in this chamber when it comes to the bedroom tax. And the conversation went like this. He said that because of uh, the recession, it was inevitable that people were losing their houses. People who had big mortgages, lost their job, had to give up their houses. And he said, and this is nearly a quote, he said, and it isn't fair that if there's somebody living next door to them in a house of the same size where they're getting housing support, that they should be allowed to live there because the other person had lost their home. Now think about that. Because somebody suffers difficulty to the point of losing their home, then the person next door should lose their home as well. And I remember saying to him that, in my view, um, that that indicated uh, false values and a false approach to dealing with people in housing need or maintaining them in their housing accommodation. And I think, to be fair, to, to be accurate, uh, he looked uh, somewhat crestfallen and embarrassed because in that moment the, minds, the mass slipped that the dogma of London when it came to the bedroom tax was clear for all to see. It wasn't about, about uh, what they claim it is about. It was at its heart that they will penalise the social tenant because the private tenant falls on hard times. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, my Alliance Party colleague, Stuart Dixon, uh, is setting at the General Alliance Party position on this welfare reform bill, um, and I accept that a, a rationale is being made uh, for opposing amendments for which members have been unable to provide costings at this stage of the bill. But I would like to take this opportunity to speak in relation to the amendments concerned with ensuring access to the provision of independent advice services. It is my experience that independent advice services provide absolutely vital assistance to the Northern Ireland Executive to ensure that people in our community receive the social security assistance to which that they are fully entitled. People in work, people out of work, some of the most vulnerable people in our community. And these are funds that help people access financial and social benefits um, for themselves, but also for the benefit of our wider community. They also help to, leave, to deliver the Minister for Social Development's vision that every individual and household across Northern Ireland receives all social security benefits to which they and their families are entitled. And the Child Poverty Alliance, which is an umbrella group made up of organisations such as Children in Northern Ireland, Save the Children, Children's Law Centre, Queen's University, University of Ulster, uh, in, in a recent report beneath the surface, Child Poverty in Northern Ireland, stated clearly that the, end, the impact of independent advice services to families during these difficult times can't be overestimated. We have also heard from Mr Atwood today how CAB figures from Great Britain show that for every £1 invested in welfare advice, around £8.80 potential savings are made to the state. So, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I firmly believe that the Department does indeed need to ensure that the advice sector is adequately resourced to provide the advice needed by people in our community. Some people ask why does that advice need to be independent, and of course the Social Security Agency uh, does extremely important work. It does have existing targets for benefit uptake, um, and it might be useful for the, the Minister in his uh, speaking opportunity today to advise the House as to how he thinks the Social Security Agency is doing in that regard. But independent advice is also crucial and independent uh, advice organisations are indeed at the heart of our communities that they serve. Uh, they can at times be more accessible than statutory agencies and people can be more at ease uh, in this location, leading to efficient assistance in relation to entitlements. They can at times have more open conversations. Uh, the advisor can therefore be better able to act, assess the claimant's entitlement uh, and the advisor the most appropriate course of action. The independent advice sector therefore 
complements statutory services. And Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, whilst the Minister for Social Development has stated that the advice sector plays a vital role in supporting people through the changes arising from welfare reforms, I am increasingly hearing serious concerns in advice organisations that accessing independent advice might become increasingly different, uh, difficult in the future. It is a message that I am hearing clearly in my own constituency uh, of East Belfast from East Belfast Independent Advice Centre, who are providing a, a vital service uh, in our community. They provide drop-in advice clinics at the East Belfast Network Centre, outreach advice clinics in local primary schools, libraries, community centres, telephone advice, home visit services, and volunteer opportunities for local people offering accredited training and work experience. They also offer specialist services in representation at social security tribunals and specialist ad advice in relation to debt. Uh, they have therefore, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, achieved significant outcomes uh, on an annual basis. In the last year, they have assisted the community to claim around £2.8 million in social security assistance. They have assisted with around £3.3 million, million, million of debt arrears, dealt with in the region of 15,000 queries for local people, and represented around 142 people at Social Security Appeal Tribunal. They have also engaged in an extremely beneficial project for East Belfast called the Community Advocacy Skills Training Project. This has advised around 20,000 people and assisted the community to access over £4.9 million in statutory entitlement to assistance. As well as achieving these quantitative outcomes, the independent qualitative evaluation report completed in 2013 that I believe the, the First Minister actually supported in launching found that the project had a, a positive impact on other outcomes as well, such as improved mental health, uh, prevented family breakdown and also uh, tackled economic inactivity in our community. Uh, it also increased skills in our community and improved, therefore, the overall advice provision across the constituency. So, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the demand for these services is only likely to increase in the near future. Uh, between the last two quarters of 2014, the number of people that this service uh, assisted increased by around 25 per cent. In December alone, the organisation made 53 referrals to food banks and 18 in January. So there is a concern uh, that the welfare reform uh, will see a spike in the demand for these services. Uh, modelling, I understand, by the Social Security Agency showed that 50 per cent uh, of those claiming DLA would be, could be in, uh, impacted adversely uh, by the move to PIP, and it is my understanding that there are around 9,500 people in receipt of DLA in East Belfast. So the Minister has said that there will be a, a package of mitigations, including hardship funds, uh, and people will need assistance to access these hardship funds. Uh, evidence from Scotland has shown that without assistance, people do struggle to access such emergency assistance. Therefore, the independent advice centres providing a vital service uh, to people in work, out of work, and some of the most vulnerable people in our community need all the help that they can get. They prevent homelessness, they tackle mental and physical ill health, and they keep families together, as well as encouraging education and employment in our communities. That has benefits not just to the individual, but the whole community. Uh, and yet, it is my understanding that East Belfast Independent Advice Centre, for example, receives around £40,000 per year from the Department for Social Development and £30,000 per year from Belfast City Council, £70,000 of public funds. So we have heard that, in total, it is estimated that there is around £4.5 million to £5 million pounds that goes into the advice sector. But I think that is quite startling that an organisation achieving the outcomes that it is for the wider community is receiving only around £70,000 in public funds to achieve those outcomes. 
As I say, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with these limited funds, the organisation and organisations like it are generating millions of pounds each year in additional financial assistance for those in most need in our community. This evidence suggests this is a sound use of public funds to invest in these services. So, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I would ask the Minister for Social Development how, in lieu of this statutory duty, he is going to ensure that our advice services have the funding that they need to achieve the outcomes that they are capable of, to which our people and our community are fully entitled. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I would also uh, like to add that it is on the record that the Alliance Party MP for East Belfast, Naomi Long, voted against uh, the benefits cap and indeed the bedroom tax at Westminster for very good reasons. Um, and indeed, there was cross-party opposition to the bedroom tax um, that we have heard of the hard-earned agreement uh, between the UK government and the Northern Ireland executive um, will set out as to how that opposition will be implemented and realised in Northern Ireland through the mitigation funds. Um, and I would ask the minister if, if he can make clear in his comments how exactly that is going to be achieved as well. I would also ask the Minister uh, to make clear how victims and survivors in our community and indeed the Commission for Victims and, uh, victims and Survivors um, will be given due regard in relation to welfare reform. It is my understanding that there are legislative obligations already in place to ensure that that would be the case, but I think it is important that he makes that clear in his comments today. Thank you. Mr Stephen Ignew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, from the outset, I, I thought it was clear uh, from, from my speech yesterday, my, my approach to this bill with my amendments, um, but I, I, I feel I need to, to perhaps make it clear, given some of the criticisms uh, that were made against uh, the amendments I've tabled. There are different ways to approach this bill. And, and I think each are legitimate, and um, I think we should then uh, argue as to the approach each, each party has taken. The Ulster Unionist Party have taken the approach that um, they would seek to amend the bill, but only where they deem they're not to, to, to be costs, although uh, Mr Wilson highlighted where he believed that there indeed were costs to their amendment. But what they sought to do with each of my amendments is criticise them because there were costs. I, I, I make no apology for the fact that there are costs to my amendment, for the simple fact that from both sides of the, 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 the House, the two uh, major signatories to the Stormont House Agreement have both given commitments that no one will be worse off under this bill. And what I have sought to do with my amendments is to put it in legislation that no one will be worse off under this bill uh, in, in, in respect to the, where I put the amendments, or, at best, or worse, to mitigate against um, the impacts where I actually believe people, people will be worse off. So uh, when I say, when I'm asked where the money comes from, I say the top-up payment, not in a glib way, but because I've been given assurances by the minister, his department, and those on the other side of the house that it's sufficient to maintain the payments that people are already receiving. If people go through my amendments, they're largely either to ensure people do not, to, that people continue to receive the payments they're receiving, albeit through, uh, in some cases through a different mechanism. Um, through universal credit, for example, as opposed to, to, to through uh, the existing benefits. Um, or indeed, in some cases, they don't even go that far. They wouldn't go as far as I like. And actually, um, for example, I'll, I'll talk about the ESA, but to um, extend that provision, which does exist um, uh, for a temporary period. So I have not, I have not sought to do anything I have not sought to say the benefit system should be more generous, of course, I would love to be able to stand here and say that. I have taken a responsible approach, which is to say, if we have this top-up, 
If we are committing to ensuring that no one is going to be worse off, let us put it in the face of the bill and give that guarantee here today. Because it's one thing saying it, it's another thing doing it. And whilst we've heard a lot about the Stormont House Agreement um, and how no one will be worse off, we have not been given the details as to how. And, and there has been some suggestion that the Stormont Castle Agreement set out the how, where the money will go, what that will look like. Um, there has been some commitment to publishing that, but I have yet to see it. And I am debating the Welfare Reform Bill today. And on that, that is the basis I go forward to protect those people who are likely to, who, who would, would appear will lose out under this bill um, if the assurances that they have been given um, are, are not met. So I just wanted to, to make that clear uh, from the outset um, that that is the approach I have taken. I, I believe it is the right approach. I accept other parties have taken a different approach. Some have made no amendments. Uh, some uh, ha have, have made amendments that they believe will not have a cost, um, and, and others, um, like myself, have made amendments that will have a cost, but we have a top-up fund for a reason, and these are the reasons. These are some of the areas in which I believe it should be being used. Come then to specifically to the bedroom tax and, and my proposal to pose Clause 69 to do what I consistently said I would do and, and seek to vote down the bedroom tax. There has been undoubtedly some mixed signals around this. Now, I know the Minister uh, and others were pained yesterday to point out commitments have been given around the bedroom tax. And that would seem to suggest that there is a consensus that the bedroom tax was a bad idea. So, for that reason, I'll not rehearse all the arguments. Um, I certainly believe it's a bad idea. I think it's been shown to be disastrous um, in its application in GB. But I believed it was ill-conceived from the very start. The very principles of the bedroom tax were wrong. It was, as, as Mr. Atwood has, has alluded to, it was about punishing people uh, who rely on support from the state. Um, it, 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 it was a punishment. It was never. Um, in my view, in, in any way, um, a, a, about making things better. But we've been told about the flexibilities that have been agreed with the government. But what I am still very unclear about, because we, we have known about this, this, this is the flexibility was, I believe was negotiated two years ago or something to that extent. So I, I'm, we've had two years, we've agreed it with the government. Why could we not agree that we put it in legislation? If we have that flexibility, why is it not in this bill? And I, I, it's not in any way that I, I, I doubt the sincerity of the minister when he says the commitments there um, or any other parties who are, are, are privy to that agreement. But I, I just fail to understand why we don't give it the security of putting it in legislation or indeed removing it from the legislation to be. To be more, more accurate about it. And then I think, I think some of the clues actually were given. It's a five-year deferral, it would seem. It's not about saying, as I think has been said, that the bedroom tax is wrong in principle. It's about saying, well, we have some practical problems with it. We don't have the housing stock. We don't have the one-bedroom houses. Um, so give us five years and we'll have more, a greater provision of one-bedroom houses and then we'll implement the bedroom tax. And I'm sorry to, to Sinn Féin, if that's what they signed up for, then that's not what they committed to. Um, because Mr Maskey alluded to, to the previous petition of concern that uh, three parties were going to sign and would have stopped the bedroom tax. What we're being presented here today is a five-year deferral, not the ending of the bedroom tax in Northern Ireland, but a deferral so that we can build more houses. And I have, I have the example of this in my constituency. I had constituents who had been campaigning for years for multi-element improvements to their housing executive bungalows. And due to various reasons that I'll not go into around housing uh, executive, um, etc. Um, I'll give way. 
I'm grateful to the member for giving way. I mean, it's just, just wanted to make sure people are, are we're all on the same wavelength. I mean, we stated very clearly, our party stated, as did others, yourself included, from the outset, that we were opposed to bedroom tax. Our principle in all of this is that we're opposed to people having to pay this bedroom tax. Yes, we want to abolish the tax. Yes, we want to have it go on. We don't want to have it on, on any uh, uh, legislative or statutory basis. But we end up with a five-party agreement. And I said this, and other members in this House have actually stood in this chamber lauding the good intentions and the good will of Lord Freud, for example. And I made it very clear that having met Lord Freud, Lord Freud basically said to all of us that I feel European. I know your circumstances in the North are different. I know that there are worse levels of unemployment. I know that there are worse levels of sickness, uh, of sickness uh, levels and so on, including mental health, not only related to the conflict, but obviously it's a big part of that. He also repeated, I know your difficulty, the stresses you have in housing because you have a lot of segregated housing areas and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, he felt our pain, but we would have to pay for anything that we wanted to do different. And that's what we're doing. So at the end of the day, whether we like the legislation or not, and, and people all have their views on that, so do we. But what we have at this moment in time is a, an agreement going on into the next number of years under which no one will have to pay the burden of that bedroom tax. Now, that, I think, is the most important message, or one of the most important messages which should be coming out of this chamber since yesterday and today, that what we have is a result of a five-party agreement trying to extract money from the British government, which was no intention ever of giving us any money. So, therefore, we have had to make choices. You are prepared to make a choice. All the parties around this table, around this chamber, have been prepared to make the choice that those who would suffer the burden of a bedroom tax will not now have to suffer that burden. Now, I think that is a good news story, rather than people having to then squabble over what is really a party political argument or political point scoring, which I think is regrettable because it is a better deal for people. So the people out there who are suffering, wondering whether they are going to have to pay a decent rent or move out of their houses, now know as a result of this five-party agreement that they will not have to suffer that. My members and interventions are to be short. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I will let Ms Kelly in, in, in one second. I, I think to sum up um, Mr Maskey's point, are we better off than where we started? We have five years deferral. Um, yeah, I, I, I accept that. Is it what was promised to, to ensure the bedroom tax didn't, was, did not apply in Northern Ireland? No, because right now, and, and I, I will let Ms Kelly in, Right now, the Department of Social Development is ensuring that more one-bedroom houses are being built, and they would not be doing that um, were it not for the intention to introduce the bedroom tax at a later stage. I, I, thank, uh, I thank the member uh, for uh, letting me in. And, uh, could I just say that would the member agree with me that the commitment and the statement, and I quote directly from Mickey Brady, who said on the 30th of July 2013, Mark McGuinness clearly stated that if the bedroom tax is brought before the Assembly, Sinn Féin will move to block its introduction in the North. And what we have today falls far short of that. I, I thank the member for her intervention. And, and Mr Story has said that that's not what's, uh, from a sedentary position, that it's not what's happening within DSD. Well, I'll give an example. I, I will in a second. Um, I'll give an example of my constituents. I, I, it started before the interventions. It started, I'd like to get through it, um, where they were requiring multi-element improvements to their bungalows. For various historical reasons, the housing executive couldn't do that. They've now been transferred to Oakley Housing. They were promised two bedroom refurbishments. Then the bedroom tax came in, in GB, and they were told that they are getting, getting one bedroom bungalows. Now, to be honest, those people, the state, they were, the, the state of the bungalows they were living in were so bad, they were grateful for anything, because they have waited years, um, and, and while political wrangling around funding of new build, uh, refurbishments, etc., um, was decided in this place, um, they were left um, in, the, in the consequences. Um, but the outcome is that their bungalows now um, are to be one bedroom rather than two because we're preparing for the implementation of the, the, the bedroom tax. I'll, I'll give way to Mr Humphrey. Uh, thank you, Member, for giving way. I, I just, in terms of the point the Member had just uh, finished before he sat down, and I, I appreciate his giving way, 
Does the member really, really believe that? Does he not listen to the, to the debate of the yesterday at all? The concessions that Minister McCausland got from the mainland department, the concessions that have been built on and secured by the current minister, and he comes off with a statement like that. It's about getting a mix. Because I have had constituents come into my office who want one bedroom bungalows. Now, you know, there is not a, 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 a plot under every bed, as you seem to think, I have to say to the member. I thank the member for his intervention. Do I genuinely believe what I'm saying? I absolutely do. I absolutely do. Um, because the policy was always for three and two bedroom build, because that's what met the needs, and that policy changed when the bedroom tax came in and GB. There has been, I've been heard no other rationale um, um, for it, um, and it was, I, I do not believe for a second that it was coincidental that it kick-started when the, the bedroom tax was, was coming into place. So I do believe it, and I, I, I hear about the concessions, and, and Mr Maskey referred to, to the costs. The, the commitment by taking the bedroom tax out of this bill it's not just saying we will not have it for the five-year period um, that we've been told is the concession, but saying that Northern Ireland has decided that we, 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 we will not have it um, at all. I'll give way. And, uh, I think uh, there, there, there's a couple of things in, in, in what you said, and maybe what you should do is to go and uh, listen to a replay of this here, because people have been at pains to point out today and, uh, yesterday and today that there was uh, that the whole institutions were in danger of collapsing. Are you saying that that's much more benefit than coming to an agreement that protects people? Well, we could have faced the full implementation of uh, the Welfare Reform Act. I used to give Ms Kelly uh, credit for a bit of wit, you know, but there was uh, 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 what Martin McGuinness said in June, and Can today is two to completely different things to the negotiate. Chair. Pardon? Sorry, Chair. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, at that time, Martin McGuinness said what we all believed, but there was a negotiation that took place at the time that made it life better for people in, uh, in this place. Principal Deputy Speaker, I really am confused. <laughs> On one hand, I'm being told that War Sinn Féin to stick to their commitment on the bedroom tax that these institutions would uh, have collapsed. And on the other hand, I'm being told that the deal ensures the bedroom tax won't come into Northern Ireland. I'm, I'm not sure which is true, um, but I, I, I will give way because I, I, I seek clarity from the member. Well, I, I mean, I do thank the member and, and with the indulgence of the Deputy Speaker. I mean, because this has turned into a, a debate between yourself and Sinn Féin, which we should probably have outside somewhere else. Because what they should be de dealing with is the bill which is in front of us today, the mitigation measures which have been agreed by all of the parties. So all of the parties have decided that what we're going to do is to subsidise the bedroom tax to the point where no one who would fall foul of a bedroom tax as a result of the London-based legislation will have to pay that burden. I think, as I've said before, I think it's a good thing. You shouldn't mistake the fact that people need to have one bedroom accommodation. You will know if you check your figures, and there are ministers around here who can also verify this. There is a far greater demand as we speak for one bedroom accommodation, which cannot and will not be met by this executive or the housing executive for that matter. So there's a greater demand for that type of accommodation, irrespective of the bedroom tax. So you need to understand, we go through every single constituency, you will see that there are housing associations, the DSD, the housing executive, are trying to get one bedroom accommodation units built, and a whole range of constituencies which are falling foul of objection after objection after objection. So just to make it very clear, that as far as I'm concerned, certainly our parties involved no conspiracy around that sticky up the figures around or, or force people into one bedroom accommodation. I can tell you, like I'm sure like yourself, I represent a lot of people single people who are looking for one bedroom accommodation, nothing to do with the housing panel because they'll be paying to rent themselves. They're not even, they wouldn't be in the seat of any panel. So don't mix up the two. I, I, I thank the member for his intervention and I, I will try to move on from this point. Um, 
I, I'm still unclear if, the, if we're not going to have a bedroom tax in Northern Ireland or we're not going to have it for five years. The, the, the agreement to fund it, given that we've had no extra money from the UK government, it's our decision how we spend our, our budget and we can decide whether this is something we want to do for five years or in the long term. Yes, we will have to fund it, but we're funding it out of our budget already. There is no additional monies come from the Treasury. We've got some loans to make people redundant. We've been allowed to move some money around, but the whole nonsense about a two billion fund was just that. It was an absolute nonsense. I will in a second. Um, money has been moved around. There is no additional money for this provision or anything else for that matter. It comes out of our block grant. Um, as I say, or, or, or money has been moved around, loans have been given, but the money is not additional. Um, it, it's not my objection at all. It's not my objection. I, I'm, I'm quite happy that we fund this. Um, but my point is that we decide how we spend our money. If we've got agreement from the Treasury, if it's agreement for five years on the bedroom tax, or is it agreement, um, or is it a case of we're choosing to, to, to fund this for five years out of our block grant? I assumed it was the latter. That seems to be the proposal in the budget. Um, but I'll, I'll give way to Mr. Humphrey. For giving way again. The, the member has obviously, over the last couple of days, expressed his um, disquiet over the Stormont House, Stormont Council agreements, and so on, in terms of the. Uh, what he sees is the lack of uh, um, information and detail that he has as a, as a party that wasn't signatory to it, and, and that I appreciate, and the First Minister conceded that yesterday. But would the member have preferred the institutions here in Northern Ireland to have collapsed? Because that's how we would have ensured that there would have been the Tory cuts imposed. That's how we would have ensured that the bedroom tax would have been imposed, and we'd have had no control over that, and would have had no opportunity to alleviate that with the concessions that the DUP ministers have conceded. Would the member accept that point? What I would say is we need to be honest with people. When people are being told we've got £2 billion in extra money, we need to make it clear that it's not true. We need to be honest about what the agreement was, what it did. The agreement, part of the agreement, said that the Treasury kindly, and its benevolence, said you can take hundreds of millions of pounds from your infrastructure uh, capital and you can transfer it to resource to make people redundant. They kindly let us do that. Now, that is not extra money. That is money we would have spent potentially on schools, on roads, on infrastructure. It was money that would have created employment in Northern Ireland. And we have moved it for a fund that the Treasury said, we will let you do this on the condition that you use it to cut the size of your public sector, a redundancy pot that will see over four years 20,000 people added to the unemployment list. That is what was in the Stormont House Agreement. That's honest. It's up to people. That I argued all along that any agreement uh, should, should, should have um, public input, and that never happened. But it's up to people to decide if that's a good deal or a bad deal. But that we should be clear as to what the deal was, and that's exactly what it was. And no one ha has disputed, disputed that because they can't dispute it. I understand the, the member's point that we're taking money from capital uh, to fund the exit scheme. I understand that entirely. But aren't we doing exactly the same in order to nullify welfare reform? Aren't we passing a welfare reform bill which on the face of it brings in reforms? And then with the other hand, we are dipping into the block grant, the very money for resource in schools and hospitals to negative the welfare reform and uh, to make it of no effect other than to reduce the amount of money we have for schools uh, and hospitals. And that seems to be something the member is happy with. Is that correct? I thank the member for his intervention because I, I think this is a, a question we, we, I think it's fair to say we have very differing politics. Um, I believe spending public money on protecting the most vulnerable in our society is something worthy of doing. And I, I make no apologies of saying that that should come out of our block grant, that should come out of public funds. For me, that is, is, is the very essence of why we pay our taxes. 
to ensure that the most vulnerable in our society are protected, to ensure when the economy collapses um, to a large extent, I, I, I'd love to blame politicians in Northern Ireland, but to a large extent through no fault of our own here, um, that people out of work have a safety net and, and can uh, provide for themselves and their families, albeit at a, a very basic level, um, to ensure that they don't, um, aren't in destitution and indeed, as, as we've seen the growth of food banks over the UK, to ensure that the state provides, rather than relying on churches and charities, um, providing handouts to, to, to people. That's why I pay my taxes. I know taxes are used as a big, ugly word, and we should reduce them all the time. Lower taxes, and, and everything will be better. But we pay taxes for a reason. We pay taxes because we believe in society. We believe that collectively we're better off um, when we put into a central pot to provide for us all, should we need it, whether it's health, education or welfare. I believe in public services. I don't believe in rebalancing the economy, which is a, a nice slogan for cutting the public sector um, uh, to shreds. Um, so I, th I thank you for your comments, Mr. Alster. I know you'll disagree with me, but I, give me the opportunity to make it very clear where I stand um, on, on this issue. To, to uh, move on um, to, to another area of housing and amendment number seven. And this is one I, I think there's been some misunderstanding of, of what amendment number seven does or indeed the rationale uh, for it. And this is around the, 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 essentially the four weeks transition payment from somebody who moves off um, benefits and gets in, in to work. I have plenty of experience of the private rented sector. Um, I have experience of housing benefit. Um, I know how these things work. And I'll, I'll, I'll lay it out as, as clearly as I can because in some of the comments I feel there was a misunderstanding. When you're on housing benefit, your rent gets paid in arrears. It's paid at the end of the month for the month just passed. Um, However, most private landlords expect rent to be paid up front in advance. As people will be well aware, most employers pay after a month work. They don't pay in advance, they pay after a month work. What Amendment 7 seeks to do is to protect people who have been paying, who have been paying their rent through housing benefit, um, who have, as we want them to do, sought work. And what this amendment is about is ensuring that work pays, that ensuring that that person who might have been living on a very basic income on benefits, who is not likely to have savings, does not fall into the trap whereby they get a job, their housing benefit is immediately stopped, and the landlord is demanding the rent. Because who loses in that situation? The individual who has sought work, like we want them to do, supposedly. Um, they've gotten a job. They lose out. And indeed, the landlord loses out because he can't claim rent. Now, he's in a position, or she's in a position, whereby they penalise the person and potentially ask them to move out for failure, breach of contract if they fail to pay their rent, or they take a hit. Um, so one of, those, one of those parties is going to lose out because someone has done what we want them to do and gotten a job. Now I think it's reasonable that we allow a, a transition payment um, for the period that person is working without receiving income. Um, I think it's a, a reasonable proposal. Others may disagree with it, but I, I think it's important that people disagree with it, they at least understand it first. Uh, Amendment 6 uh, is around the, the shared accommodation rate for young people. The, the, again, the very premise of, of the proposal in this bill to me is discriminatory. It treats young people differently. 
and by young people, it's increased young people up to age 34. Now, I turned, I turned 35 last year. I, I know my colleague, my young colleague, Mr. Little, is, is, is still 34. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll not, I'll not uh, sorry, Chris, I hope that, that's not personal information. But I'll, I'll use myself in the example. I'll go back, I'll go back to, to, to my last birthday when I, I was still 34. I had a job. I had two children, I had a partner, I had a house. These institutions were under threat. There's a potential I could have lost my job. There's the potential that me losing my job and the stress that created in my family would have put strain on my relationship. And my relationship might have broke down. So I'd have been unemployed, I'd have been single, I'd have had two kids. And I'd been told by, firstly, the Tory government where this has come from, but now this Northern Ireland executive that proposes to pass this legislation, that we will only support you to live in shared accommodation where you might not be able to bring your children, and which might be completely unsuitable to your needs. Immediately. We are immediately going to punish you for losing your job and the breakdown in your relationship because they weren't bad enough. We really do want to kick you when you're down. Um, what my amendment proposes is not, you know, to, to, to scrap that proposal, though I'd like to. It's a reasonable amendment to say, give that person one year to find a new job or to find a new home. Do not punish them from the day and hour that they lose their job or that their relationship breaks down. I think that's reasonable. I think that would be the sign of a government that understands the needs of people who find themselves unemployed. And I think it would say that this assembly does not follow the rationale of the Tory welfare cuts, which is punish people for being unemployed, um, but recognises the real life stories um, as to why people find themselves in these circumstances. Amendment 27 is, uh, and, and indeed uh, my opposition to Clause 54, is around the youth provision of ESA. Now, as I understand it, this is a payment received from a very small by a very small number of disabled young people, and it recognises that um, due to age, that the contrib contributory ESA would not be available to these young people, other than for the provisions that are present in our current welfare legislation. And my proposal um, is that they could, should continue. Um, into the new legislation. My understanding is, again, that uh, and the minister um, can, can, can clarify, um, my understanding is that the commitment is, again, that they, these people will not lose out under the current proposals. My proposal, again, as it has been consistently, is to put that in the bill, to put that uh, protection in the bill. Um, but I, I wait to hear the... Uh, the uh, advice of the Minister as, as to his proposals in, in relation to the youth payment of ESA. Um, Amendment 5 is uh, around the disability edition, and again it comes back to saying, to putting in the bill the commitment that no one will be worse off. As things stand, um, there would be a reduction on universal credit uh, for, of £26 per week for families who receive um, the disability addition. Again, if we're committed to making sure no one's worse off, um, I believe we should give a commitment to ensure that that disability addition remains as part of universal credit. Again, my proposal is that it is in the bill. Um, I wait to hear if the minister, um, uh, through the, the supplementary payments, um, is committed to uh, uh, ensuring that, that those families affected uh, will not lose out. Um, 
Amendment 73 is uh, in relation to those who are self-employed and the assumption that's made that those who are, in terms of benefit calculations, that those who are self-employed receive the, the, the minimum income. And again, the, the point was made uh, yesterday evening about wanting to make work pay, incentivising people to work. Um, I don't believe that people set up their own businesses really believe that, you know, I'm only doing this because I can't get enough benefits, and if you just give me more benefits, I wouldn't bother with this whole business stuff. It's quite hard. I think people who set up their own businesses are driven. But when the economy does take a downturn, um, and when they can't receive a minimum income, never mind a, a living wage um, from, from their business, I think it's right. Uh, that we do a proper assessment of need rather than what we somehow think should be the case. Well, if you have a business, you should be earning a minimum income. It's not always the reality, and I think we should protect um, those in small businesses, encouraging them. And when they're doing well, of course, they should, uh, they should come off benefits, um, and the assessment should be done on that basis. But when things aren't going so well, and we should not simply say, well, we're not going to, to meet your needs um, because you're a business person and we don't want you to become, as was suggested yesterday, too reliant on benefits. Because I don't believe that is the ambition of anyone who establishes a business. Um, amendment 75, I think the, the, the last of uh, the Green Party amendments, um, is, is around the full conditionality for work for EU nationals. I have been provided with evidence. I believe the, the committee has been provided with evidence, and indeed, the, I have no doubt the minister has been provided with evidence that this clause, uh, as currently drafted, should it be unamended and would breach uh, EU rules. Um, if the minister has counter evidence, I would be interested to hear it. But it does leave us open to a situation where two workers employed in the same job in the same company, um, one from Northern Ireland or from the UK, and one from outside the UK but still within the EEA, um, become unemployed at the same time, and we treat one differently from the other. A bit like what I said about uh, young people in relation to the shared accommodation. Um, that's legislating for discrimination. Um, I don't accept that as, as how I want to see our society. Um, and I have to say I'm, I, I'm disappointed because this was originally a, an amendment um, proposed by, by, by Anna Liu, um, who probably could have spoken with much more uh, conviction in this issue. Uh, given perhaps our experiences of working with ethnic minorities in Northern Ireland. Um, so I, I'm, I'm disappointed that, that Alliance have withdrawn from their amendment. I, I don't believe it would breach anything that I understand about the Stormont House Agreement and that it, it, um, it, it would not incur significant cost. Um, but uh, obviously part of that deal was that it appears that uh, no amendment should be made. Um, and as I say, I think it's, it's, it's regrettable in this case because uh, I think it's a, clearly a minority um, fighting this cause um, for minorities, and um, uh, I stand to do it. Uh, well, I, I believe with the support of the SDLP, and I, I welcome that. Um, a few final points, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I do note. Uh, I suppose with a, a wry smile, the establishment of um, the discretionary support commissioner, um, the wry smile because the party opposite is the, 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 the champion of the bonfire of the Quangos in Northern Ireland, um, but we see the, the creation of a new commissioner. Um, I think it's necessary. Um, I personally believe commissions um, and indeed commissioners are, are, are necessary, and, and I commend the, the work of the Children's Commissioner, the Human Rights Commission, and the Equality Commission, um, <coughs> unlike those opposite. But the next time 
the next time that they stand up here and, and blanket dismiss these commissions, um, I will remind them um, that today they, they seek to establish the discretionary support commissioner. Um, and uh, finally, on Amendment 42 in relation to the benefit cap. There's two possibilities in relation to the benefit cap. There, you either believe the benefits are paid on the basis of need. And if you believe in that, by proposing a benefit cap, you believe that we're overestimating the need which is why some people go above this cap. In which case, then you need to reevaluate re the whole benefit system. Or you disagree with the fundamental principle of benefits, which is uh, to, to, to meet the basic needs of our citizens. Um, and if that's the case, I wonder why you support welfare. At all. So I, I find it hard to understand the rationale of the benefits cap, um, other than a, a, a cheap political um, uh, kind of defence of, of the welfare system. We can't stand up and defend it passionately and with conviction. So we'll 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 put this artificial cap on, regardless of the need of families, and we disadvantage people um, in order in order that we uh, face down some, some pressure. And I wouldn't even say public pressure, I'd say pressure from the media. Um, but if you believe in the principle of benefits based on need, I, I think the benefits cap is, is regrettable. And I welcome the, the SDLP's proposed amendment to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And uh, we return to the second group uh, of the amendments, and I'll trust, I, I trust that we'll try and make some progress in relation uh, to, to this as we move forward. During uh, yesterday's debate, I covered uh, what uh, clause, four, uh, clause 4 does in setting out the basic conditions uh, that must be met in order to be entitled uh, to universal credit. I'm grateful that the chair of the committee has indicated his intention not to move the opposition tabled in relation to different clauses in this grouping. Clause 4 specifies the basic conditions of the entitlement for universal credit. Clause 3 states that a claimant must meet the basic conditions as well as the financial conditions. Therefore, should the tabled amendment to Clause 4 be accepted, an amendment would also have to be made to Clause 3. As is the case currently with Social Security benefits and tax credits, there will be basic conditions uh, which the claimant will have to meet for entitlement to universal credit. These basic conditions are relevant to the policy and are considered to be compatible with EU obligations. It would be highly unusual for there to be no basic conditions for entitlement to Social Security benefits or tax credits, as this would make the system unworkable. Universal credit is primarily designed to support people of working age who are living in the United Kingdom. Therefore, the purpose of Clause 4 is to ensure that people between 18 and the qualifying age for the state pension credit and who are living in Northern Ireland will receive support appropriate to their circumstances. Specifying the specific conditions for entitlement avoids duplication of provision, such as the support for students and the state pension credit system. It also limits universal credit to EU nationals who uh, attest a right to uh, reside here and are habitually uh, resident. In addition, acceptance of the claimant commitment will ensure that appropriate work-related requirements are placed on claimants to help them into work. Amendment number two, uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and I I want to just briefly explain what Clause 6 does, because I think it's important as we, we do work our way through these, while I appreciate it can sometimes be laborious and it can sometimes uh, be uh, tedious, yeah, it is important in relation to putting some factual comment on the record. Because I have to say, if yesterday is anything to go by, there is a lot of inaccuracy. Mm. And I have to say, if you were to listen to the sum of the comments that have been made on the media this morning. 
there is a lot of people who really do need to take a long, hard look at some of the things that they've been saying. But I will say this, at least some of them had the courtesy to this House to come and make the comments in this House when some of them never appeared in this House yeah. all day yesterday. Well, Mr McNary, so quite capable of going on to the media and grandstanding yesterday, or this morning. Where was he yesterday? He never appeared in this House all day. Now, what's the respect for this House? What's the respect for the legislative process? That, I think, shows where the political grandstanding is in terms of these things. Good morning, Minister. So, now, now he probably was watching his monitor, and as a result of that, we have at least had one success today in that now he has appeared into the chamber. Clause 6 provides regulations making powers for restrictions on entitlement to universal credit, even though the basic conditions and financial conditions are met. Regulations under this clause may also be used to remove entitlement to universal credit, where that entitlement would only exist for a short period. This avoids the administrative costs of pro uh, processing an award which could only result in a very small payment. Similarly, this clause provides for an award to begin only after a specified number of days have elapsed since the date of the claim. We intend to provide for a waiting days rule, which is a feature of existing out-of-work benefits and operates to limit administrative costs. The clause limits any, working, any waiting day provision to a maximum of seven days. Amendment 2 seeks to reduce this to three days. The principle behind the waiting days policy is that benefits are not intended to provide financial support for every uh, benefit breaks in employment of periods of sickness. Many people come to benefits differently from employment, and it is reasonable to expect them to use prior earnings to budget for an initial period of unemployment. Job Seekers Alliance and Employment and Support Alliance currently have seven waiting days at the start of a claim, and the intention is to carry this practice forward into universal credit, hence the necessity for this clause. To accept Amendment 2 would have potential financial implications for Northern Ireland Block Grant, as claimants in Northern Ireland would be receiving preferential treatment compared to claimants elsewhere in Great Britain. The impact of this would be difficult to justify and would create the potential for wider and significant equality issues between claimants in Northern Ireland and in Great Britain. For these reasons, I would urge members to reject Amendment 2. Amendment number 5 relates to Clause 10, which provides for an amount to be included within the calculation of universal credit award for claimants who are responsible for children or qualifying young people. Under the provisions outlined in the Bill as drafted, an additional amount will be paid to universal credit claimants if the dependent child or qualifying young person is disabled. This is consistent with the objectives of universal credit of simplicity and affordability. This element of universal credit will replace child tax credit as the main source of extra support for children in low-income families and out of work, as now child benefit will remain separate. Universal credit is designed to simplify the current benefit systems and will therefore not replicate the range of complex premiums currently paid to disabled adults and to children. Money saved from the abolishing these premiums will be recycled and used to target support to those disabled people with the greatest need. The universal credit rate payable to severely disabled children will be higher than the current child tax credit equivalent. However, the lower rate of universal credit disabled child entitlement will be less than the lower rate of child tax credits. Let me provide assurance to, I think it was Mr. Beggs, uh, who made a uh, comment to this uh, during his contribution, that families who are uh, mitigated or, or migrated to universal credit and those whose children attract the lower rate of disability element will receive transitional protection. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to 
uh, give that to the member who raised the particular issue. There are other provisions within universal credit which complement this policy of simplifying matters. For example, for working parents, there is a higher earnings disregard for those in receipt of a disabled child element and any household in receipt of disability living allowance or working tax credits will be excluded from the benefit cap. In addition, existing claimants who are migrated to universal credit through a managed process will have their award protected by transitional protection. This will ensure that current benefit claimants will not receive less as a result of their move to universal credit where circumstances remain the same. Amendment 5 specifies that the lower rate should be no less than two-thirds of the higher rate. This amendment would seek to retain the current position under tax credits where the disabled child element equates to two-thirds of the severely disabled child element. The, state, apologies, the stated policy intent for universal credit is to create a simple, streamlined benefit system and to realign arrangements for disabled children with those of disabled adults when they reach age 18. This is not a savings exercise, but a recognition and a refocusing of support that already exists. Money released as a result of those adjustments will be reinvested in support for the most severely disabled people. And I think that, again, it goes back to my point, and I don't want this, members, to become a trait comment. And I know we can have a lot of argy-bargy around uh, the uh, issue, and, and we have said all the things in relation to uh, what politics, unfortunately, brings to us all, that element of uh, confrontation and that argument of spirit that is, seems to be inherent in it. But let's remember... We are talking about children and adults in our community who are disabled. And sometimes, and I do say this again, let's remember this is about real people in our communities. And when I listen to some of the comments this morning, it is, it is as though we wanted to fight the orange and green battle again and that somehow, if you happen to be on the nationalist, republican, green side, you're not entitled to anything. And if you're on the loyalist, unionist, protestant community, you get nothing. I think that would be an awful simplification and an awful disservice to what we're trying to achieve here. And so, when we focus in around this particular issue, let's try to have some sense of humanity, some sense of the impact that this has on families who have children and adults who are disabled. So to accept this amendment that the lower rate should be less than the two-thirds of the higher rate would reduce the amount of money available for the more severely disabled people. The GB Welfare Reform Act of 2012 Yes, I'll give it. Just in the light of, of those comments uh, where he's reiterated his commitment to people and that is accepted, can I just refer you back to the previous amendment, Amendment 2, when you said, subject to what Hansard said, says, that uh, it's reasonable to expect people to carry their own costs for a week before um, accessing Job Seekers Alliance or ESA. So the words you said were reasonable to expect people to carry their own costs for a week. Now, if somebody has uh, got a lot of children or is in low pay, is it reasonable to expect them to carry those costs for a week? And in those circumstances, is three days not better? And in any case, is the three-day flexibility, would that not be covered by any headroom that exists or doesn't exist in respect of the overall notional Northern Ireland welfare cap? Just for, well, for clarity, and I thank the member for his, his intervention, what I did say was that, that many people come to benefit directly from employment, and it is reasonable to expect them to use prior earnings to budget for an initial period of unemployment. And I think the clause, as I did say, limits any waiting days provision to a maximum of seven days. And 
the amendment two would seek to reduce this to three days. So I think that, that is the context that I, that I made those comments. That is not in any way to minimise the concern that the member has and has raised it on a number of occasions in relation to this. Could, could I press you further? A lot of people get paid in arrears. You and I get paid in arrears, I think. But we do get paid in arrears. So they, they have spent the money, you know, if you like, they've spent the money in advance of receiving it. And there mightn't be that much money left to cover the cost for a week, especially if you're low paid, and especially if you've got uh, family needs. Yeah, again, I think the member makes, makes a point, but I think we still have to ensure that when we put in place uh, these, this framework, that it is a framework which is uh, practical, it's a framework which is uh, deliverable, and it, it is difficult. And, and this was, I think, a point that was made even this morning by some that it's difficult to have a situation where you will, in every eventuality, cover every situation and every circumstance. But I still think, yes, uh, give me. Would the Minister accept that um, the argument that people are pay, most people are paid in arrears, so therefore when people get paid at the end of the week, normally that is the money to lay aside for the next week. So the argument that he is making is perfectly valid, that if people are coming from employment into unemployment, they've received their last week's wages, their last week's wages are usually what they sp use to finance the, the, the incoming week. Thank the member for those comments, and uh, I'm sure uh, the member opposite will be glad to see that Mr Wilson ha has now uh, given or graced the chamber with his presence because I felt earlier on that uh, maybe there was withdrawal symptoms by some members uh, opposite that uh, Mr Wilson wasn't here. So I I'm glad that, that, that he is here and I, and I thank him for those comments. Can I move on uh, to maybe just conclude in relation to Clause 10? If Clause 10 is not allowed to stand as part of the bill, this would mean that we in Northern Ireland would have to consider an alternative means of providing support for children as the Tax Credit Act 2002 will be replaced when tax credits are fully uh, subsumed into and replaced by universal credit. This will have the effect of uh, disadvantaging people here from obtaining support for children, including those with disabilities. To accept this amendment would clearly breach the existing parity arrangements and could have, uh, I think, implications for Northern Ireland in relation to the block grant and also in relation to utilising the IT system that has been designed to uh, universal credit and is provided through DWP. And let's remember, remember the whole issue away a number of months ago about, oh, well, we'll just dump welfare reform and we'll, we'll go it alone. Remember the costs associated with having a separate IT system. I'm glad we have moved well on. And, and the member, Mr Atwood, always talks about that somewhere lurking in the shadows of all of this is the long tentacles of DWP. Well, I would remind the member, we are part of the United Kingdom. And the mother of parliaments is Westminster. And we are United Kingdom citizens and there is a working relationship, and I am very appreciative of that working relationship that we have with DWP. And in this issue, and in, as we roll out uh, the introduction of these uh, changes to our welfare system, we will be very dependent upon ensuring that that relationship is uh, as it has been in the past, given the IT issues, given the challenges of changing from one system to another. So the cost of, as we have said, of developing and financing a standalone system has been long since uh, set to aside because we know that it wasn't just possible. So for those reasons, I again would urge members to reject the proposed amendment. If I could move to Amendment 6 and 7, which relates to Clause 11. Clause 11 provides for an amount to be included for the support of housing costs within universal credit. It enables the award of universal credit to include such an amount if the claimant is liable to make payments on their home and in, in the form of rent, mortgage costs or other housing related costs. The wider reform agenda will see housing benefit abolished with the rent element of it replaced by the housing cost element within the universal credit award. Clause 11 will provide for the continuing provision of housing support for eligible claimants. 
Subsection 4 of this clause provides for regulations to be set out uh, to de the detailed rules for calculating the amount of housing support payable. As I have indicated, two amendments have been tabled for this clause, and I think it would be helpful to members if I firstly explain how I intend to deal with amendment number six. This amendment refers to a reduction based on the age of the claimant. There are two age bands in relation to the housing cost element of universal credit, those under 25 and those under 35. A tenant living with a young person aged over 25 will have their housing cost element reduced by £68 a month. This is known as the housing cost contribution. Given that the housing cost element is reduced for those tenants living with a young person aged over 25, I shall deal with the amendment in this context. It has long been a feature of the benefit system that someone living in a claimant's home should be expected to contribute towards the rent. Under universal credit, there will be a flat rate deduction known as a housing cost contribution of £68 a month for, a, for most adults over 25 years of age. This housing cost contribution will not apply to tenants living with an out-of-work young person or student aged under 25. Amendment 6, as drafted, would provide for a 52-week uh, exemption from the use of the housing cost contribution in the situation of a person under 25 who is in work. It is considered right that the entitlement to universal credit, which is an income-related household benefit, should be reduced where there is available income. Amendment 7 relates to a run-on in the housing cost element of four weeks after a claimant starts employment. While the housing cost element will continue in payment for those expected to remain uh, in uh, prison for up to six months, it is considered that where there is available income, a run-on would not be appropriate. There would be potential cost implications again for the Northern Iron Block Grant if these amendments were to be accepted. It would also result in claimants in Northern Ireland being subject to, again, preferential treatment compared to claimants in Great Britain. The impact of this would be difficult to justify and to create the potential for wider and significant equality issues. For these reasons, I would urge members to reject the proposed amendment. Uh, yes, sir. I, I thank the Minister for giving way. He, he said that uh, citizens in Northern Ireland um, would be subject to preferential treatment than, than those in Great Britain. Surely everyone who receives a supplementary payment as part of the top-up will be in preferential situation to those in Great Britain? Yes, but I think the member fails to understand the fundamental difference. We're paying for it. It's not affecting uh, what we're paying for and what decisions we have made in relation to additions to ensure that we have a Northern Ireland uh, plus or a GB plus model, we are play, paying for it out of the block grant. So therefore, uh, that is accepted because it is not having an impact in terms of our AME. So I think that that's the reason. And let's remember the first package of measures were agreed by DWP, by uh, the uh, government uh, at Westminster. Uh, these packages of measures have been endorsed by uh, the government at Westminster in that that was the outworkings of the agreements that we uh, secured. So I think that there needs to be that understanding. And when I make those comments in relation to differential uh, treatment, they are made in that context. And I think that that is where we can have the justification to do uh, what we are doing. Always mindful, always mindful that we have endeavoured in terms of these uh, uh, proposals and what is contained in the bill to ensure we retain parity with the rest of the United Kingdom. So for those reasons, uh, I would urge members uh, to reject the proposed amendments in relation to uh, the uh, amendments that I've mentioned. Moving on to Amendment 27, maybe helpful to, if I summarise exactly what Clause 52 does uh, in, in regards to uh, this particular amendment. Employment and Support Allowance is currently structured 
into contributory and income related benefits. If a person does not satisfy the national insurance conditions for the contributory allowance, they can claim the income related allowance provided they satisfy the eligibility criteria. Clause 52 introduces a time limit for the period which a person in the work related activity group is entitled to receive the contributory ESA. The proposal is that a limit to, the, to be the 365 days and this change supports the move towards a simplification of contributory benefits and a fairer benefit system. The rates payable are the same for both contributory and income related and the ESA claimed on either basis can be paid until state pension age. People can at present qualify for unlimited contributory ESA on the basis of a small amount of national insurance paid. However, ESA was never intended to be a benefit for the long term, except for the most severely ill or disabled for whom work is not a viable option in these cases. For example, those in the support group, uh, ESA will not be time limited. It will also reinforce the fact that for the majority, ESA is a temporary benefit and aligns the rules for the contributory allowance more closely with contributory job seekers allowance. Amendment 27 proposes the removal of the time limiting aspects for ESA youth claimants. And I would reiterate that those in the support group will not be affected by time limiting. Time limiting will only impact for those who are in work related activity group who are temporarily unable to work because of an illness or disability. There is no objective justification for treating young people any differently from others. Equal treatment should be applied to all claimants irrespective of age. As the House will be all too aware, the impact of this measure has raised serious concerns uh, amongst a number of members. However, in accordance with the terms of, of the Stormont House Agreement, my department is currently developing proposals for the provision of an additional financial support for those claimants who will be adversely impacted by the time limiting restriction proposed for ESA. The support will be designed to supplement their incomes as they adjust to the new arrangements. It is my intention to table an amendment at further consideration stage to facilitate this additional financial support. <coughs> Removing Clause 52 would undoubtedly lead to further fines on the Northern Ireland Block Grant. For these reasons, I would urge members to reject Amendment 27. <coughs> Moving to Amendments 28, 29 uh, to Clause 54. Clause 54 abolishes the special concessions that now uh, certain young people uh, to qualify for contributory employment and support allowance without meeting the usual paid national insurance contribution conditions that apply to all others. This measure applies to new claims only and the existing claimants will remain on contributory ESA. However, youth claimants who are in the work-related activity group will be subject to a time limit of 365 days. Those who are in the support group will be unaffected and will, and will uh, as will anyone receiving income related ESA, whichever group they are assigned to. The normal rules are that a person must have paid or been credited with sufficient national insurance contributions in the tax years that are relevant to the claim in order to qualify for contributory allowance. There are special conditions for young people who are exempt from meeting the usual paid national insurance conditions. These provide that a person aged 16 to 19 or under 25 in certain prescribed circumstances, who is not in full-time education and has had limited uh, capability for work for 196 consecutive days, will be entitled to contributory ESA. Clause 54 repeals these provisions of the Welfare Reform Act Northern Ireland 2007 and prevents new claims for contributory allowance being made on the specific grounds of youth from the date the clause comes into operation. After that, people who would have benefited from the concessions will be required to meet 
the usual uh, contribution conditions which apply to all uh, contributory ESA claims. As I have previously stated, there is no objective justification for treating young people any differently uh, than others. No other age group can qualify for contributory ESA without having paid or being treated as having paid national insurance contributions, nor does any other contributory benefit have similar arrangements. The vast majority of claimants who presently receive contributory ESA on grounds of youth, around 90%, are expected to receive the income-related ESA. Those who don't qualify for income-related ESA are likely to have capital in excess of £16,000 or a partner in full-time work who may be entitled to working tax credit. This change is another step in simplifying the benefit system to facilitate the introduction of universal credit. Clause 54 does not prevent claimants under 20 from making claims to ESA. The only change is that they will have to meet the same conditions as everyone else who applies. If they have not paid sufficient contributions, they will be assessed for income-related ESA rather than contribution-based ESA, both of which are paid at the same rate. Amendment 28 adds in the words, unless the claimant had made contributions before the commencement of the site. These words are not required as if the uh, as if the claimant had paid sufficient national insurance contributions, he will qualify under the normal rules, and this clause is only amending the special conditions for young people. Amendment 29 adds additional words to paragraph 4 of Schedule 1 of the Welfare Reform Act, Northern Ireland 2007, which would require the claimant to have limited capability for work after the assessment phase has ended. Limited capability for work is one of the conditions of entitlement a claimant must satisfy before he can be eligible for uh, an ESA award. Therefore, the additional words are unnecessary. The purpose of Schedule 1 is to describe the conditions of entitlement to a contributor ESA award relating to national insurance contributions, with the special conditions for youth being set out in paragraph 4. The clause has also been uh, uh, opposed. Removing this clause would enable the youth claimants to continue to be treated more beneficially than claimants of any other age. And I've already indicated that there's no objective justification for such treatment. And for those reasons, uh, I would urge members to reject Amendments 28 and 29. Turning then, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, to the uh, clauses 61, 62, and 63. And these uh, ensure claimants can only receive contributory job seekers allowance, contributory employment and support allowance, maternity allowance or statutory payments if they are entitled to be in employment in the United Kingdom. There was never any policy intention that a person with no entitlement to work in the UK should receive out-of-work benefits as this condition of entitlement will ensure that this situation can no longer arise. It is important to protect the public purse by only paying benefits when and to whom it is appropriate to do so. And I would urge members to reject uh, the opposition to these three clauses. Clause 69, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, introduces the size criteria into the calculation of housing benefit for working age tenants in the social housing sector. And I'm well aware of all the discussion and debate and concern that there is around this particular clause. And I want to uh, work my way through this, and I trust uh, it will be of benefit. I recognize that what is proposed represents a major change for the social sector tenants. However, I also am acutely aware that we as a society must act to reduce the spiring costs of housing benefit and restore fairness to the system. It is manifestly unfair that currently the rate of housing benefit that tenants in the private rented sector receive is related to the size of dwelling the claimant needs, whereas no restrictions are placed on those in the social housing sector. 
in considering how best to move forward. I have focused on balancing the need to protect people and communities from the worst aspects of the policy with the need to ensure that we make the best use of our limited social housing stock and that we do not implement measures which hinder or even discourage mobility. Rather than removing the clause from the legislation, I have discussed with the executive colleagues if and how the discretionary housing payments budget can be further enhanced so that tenants will not be impacted until such times as the housing stock matches the need. The executive, and that is the Northern Ireland executive, of which there is members in this House, of which there is a five-party agreement on, just in case in the midst of all the mist and all that has been said over the last 24 hours, somehow that has been lost. So the executive has agreed to create a separate fund of £17 million per annum, which will mitigate the impact of this measure by protecting existing and future tenants from any reduction in their housing benefit, unless there is a significant change in their personal circumstances or they are offered suitable alternative accommodation. Officials are currently developing, just, just let me uh, conclude, uh, just because this is important, because we're somehow uh, accused yesterday by some that there is yet again these secret, these very uh, suspicious discussions going on and that somehow we're all in a big plot and we're all in a big plan and of course I'm the one who has to uh, implement it. Well, let me be open, let me be transparent and let me tell members what has been agreed. So we've agreed, the executive has agreed, the fund and officials in my department are currently developing a scheme which will go to the executive for agreement prior to public consultation. The outcomes from this consultation will form the basis for the subordinate legislation. And in accordance with the terms of the Stormont House Agreement, my department is currently developing its proposals for the provision of additional enhanced uh, the uh, DHP, as it will become uh, known as, for claimants who will be adversely impacted through the introduction of this measure. And I would advise members that I will be bringing forward an amendment at the further consideration stage to facilitate this. I give way to the member. I thank the Minister for giving way, because obviously when I, I, I discussed this issue there was some confusion, and I, I think he has cleared it up, and, and I just want to, to, to confirm that. The policy is that a mitigation fund will be put in place until such time as the housing stock is suitable in order that we implement the bedroom tax. Is that what the Minister is saying? Because I think it's important that this matter is made clear. Let me, let me repeat to the member, because maybe again he, he didn't hear. We've created a separate fund of £17 million per annum, which will mitigate the impact of the measure by protecting existing and future tenants from any reduction in their housing benefit. And here, there, there's no secret in this. We also have to balance that against the reality, unless there is a significant change in their personal circumstances, or they are afforded suitable alternative accommodation. And we will see that in terms of developing the scheme, uh, which really will be uh, a replication of the discretionary housing payments, uh, which is currently in existence. And then, uh, but let me come to a point that the member made earlier. And it was as though somehow uh, there was uh, no need for us to look at issues in regards to housing and single uh, properties, single bedroom properties uh, in uh, certain locations. If I look at his own constituency, 
The breakdown of applicants in housing stress for North Down on the waiting list for those who are looking for single accommodation, for single bedroom accommodation, is 35% of those who are on the waiting list. So there is a need. So that is an issue that we are going to have to, and with the other responsibilities which I have, which if I could get some more time devoted to it, uh, as I have been doing while waiting on getting agreement in relation to bringing this bill to the House, I do want to move in regards to the issue of the long-term sustainable future of the housing executive, the nature of what we do, the way in which we do our business, and so that we continue to build and continue to improve and continue to ensure that it, as far as I am responsible for and my department is responsible for, we have good quality homes for people in Northern Ireland, irrespective of where they live, and that will have a mixed provision. And that will not be solely down to one or two or three bedroom types. It will have that mix and it will have that provision in it. I think that is what we ought to be about. That is a long-term challenge and that is a long-term issue for this executive. I appreciate the Minister for, for giving way again. And, and I, I suppose I just want to be clear as to what my objection is. The Minister, as far as I can tell, has laid out that there is a discretionary payment for those who cannot find alternative suitable accommodation, whereby they're, they're in a house um, that's greater than their deem, needs are deemed to be. He is making it clear that the, he is, intends to improve the housing stock um, in terms of diversity of number of bedrooms. I suppose what I was trying to make clear in my submission is that there are those who, like the Minister, who, who, who subscribe to this policy that should there be smaller accommodation for someone and their needs change, um, they should move. But there are those who said they disagreed with that policy and have signed up to this. And it is them I am trying to expose um, when I, I, I seek to make it clear that, that this is essentially a phased introduction of the bedroom tax. Plain and simple what it is. It's a phased introduction, but it is still being introduced in Northern Ireland. I, well, I think the member should ask others, not the minister. I think there's another issue in relation to this. One of the practical reasons as to why we need to have the retention of clause 69 is so that the calculation can be made uh, so that when we come to implement the, the payment of the scheme, that it can be done. If clause 69 wasn't in the bill, then I would have a huge difficulty in making the calculation on the basis of the, the clause not being in the bill. So there's, again, let's dispense this uh, myth that somehow this is us some, uh, in some clandestine way trying to introduce the bedroom tax. But there are practical, and sometimes, and I know the member maybe struggles to, to get his head around this issue, but there are some times when you're dealing with a five-party mandatory coalition, you know, like, that ain't easy. When you're then dealing with trying to transcribe legislation which is uh, in the uh, House of Commons into Northern Ireland legislation, there are challenges and there are difficulties. But then there are also the practical implications as to how you want to get to a certain point. And there are some times when it is easier to allow something to remain in the primary legislation, which can give you the benefit of working out the calculation in regards to how we would use and how we would uh, actually fund or pay the uh, fund that we will uh, set out over the next number of weeks to the executive and to this House. So, for those reasons, I will, but I, I do want to make some progress, uh, and because but, if, if the member is brief, if that's possible. I, I think you were right, uh, Minister, to identify the long-term issue about um, the profile of uh, housing stock in Northern Ireland, but in the, short term, in the short term, this is the critical question, I think. If there is a tenant who someone decides there is a significant change in their personal circumstances, 
and that there is suitable alternative accommodation. And that tenant says, I don't want to move from my three bedroom. Will they or will they not be subject to the bedroom tax? Well, I think that, that will be de dependent on what we will develop in terms of the scheme. And we cannot, we cannot find, uh, we cannot in this house. And you know, I've heard a lot of comment in the last 24 hours that they want us to be definitive on every individual single. And there is no doubt what will happen. There will be those who, for their own political reasons, if they could recognise what a benefit claim form was in some of their cases, will bring out examples of, here you said there wasn't going to be this. Well, here's the evidence. Now, let's remember we are dealing with a complex situation with families who have a variety of challenging, complex circumstances. Not everybody's family is uh, as uh, unified as we would like them to be. Families today are more diverse. There are things, and let me say this, and I say this on a personal basis, there are things that happen in our families that we would have preferred were not the case, but we have to deal with the circumstances and the situations. The system, and if there was no protection, if there was no structure for those circumstances to be dealt with, then you would be coming to this house and saying, we have no systems, we have no safeguards, and we have no security. So I, I can't give to this house uh, a blank check which says that in every set of circumstances in relation to all of these issues that we're dealing with in this house, that every one of them will be dealt with exactly the same. You know the reason why? Because every one of their circumstances won't be exactly the same. We've only been through the issues in relation to the ESA, uh, the uh, situation in regards to it. It's complex. So those are the things that we have to deal with. But I would ask the member to uh, give us the indulgence to ensure that when we as officials are, uh, and I hope to be in a position to see them relatively soon, to develop the scheme which will go to the executive uh, and will, I trust, give some clarity. And I want to move on to Amendment uh, 42. And Amendment 42 seeks to revise uh, which benefits are included in the calculation of the benefit cap. The proposal is to remove child benefit, carers allowance and any benefits uh, or components of the benefits received for caring responsibilities. The primary objective of the CAP is to tackle the culture of welfare dependency by setting a clear limit to what people can expect to get from the benefit system. It is important that the benefit system is fair and it is seen to be fair, not just fair to benefit recipients, but also to the taxpayers whose taxes pay for our welfare system. It is neither reasonable nor fair that households in receipt of out-of-work benefits should receive a greater income from benefits than working households earning the average weekly wage. This clause will allow us to prescribe in regulations how the benefits cap will operate. The cap will apply to the combined income from the main out-of-work benefits, job seekers allowance, income support, employment and support allowance, housing benefit, child benefit and child tax credit, and other benefits such as carers allowance. Households which include a member who is receiving a disability living allowance will be exempt. This is in recognition that disability living allowance is paid to people to help with extra costs arising from their disability. For carers, the benefit system is designed to provide financial support where caring responsibilities prevent carers from working full time. And as such, it is only right that carers' allowance should be counted alongside other in uh, income maintained benefits. Child benefit is an allowance which is paid to help with the expense of raising a child. As such, it should also be counted alongside other income maintenance benefits. 
Initially, the benefit cap will be delivered through uh, housing benefit payments, so households who are not getting housing benefit will not have the cap applied. Ultimately, it will be administered as part of the new universal credit system. To amend the list of benefits which are included in the calculation of the benefit cap would be a clear breach of parity and would result in the financial penalty to the Northern Ireland Block Grant. However, as I have previously stated, in accordance with the terms of the Stormont House Agreement, my department is currently developing proposals for the provision of an additional financial support to claimants that will be adversely impacted by welfare reform, including the benefit cap. I will be bringing a paper to the executive in the, in the future, setting out, and I would hope it will be in the near future, setting out how far it is proposed to move forward with welfare reform, including the modalities of implementing the different schemes agreed at the Stormont House Agreement. And I propose to bring forward an enabling clause for these schemes at further consideration stage of the bill. At this time, my department is currently working through the different payment scenarios in terms of assistance from the supplementary payment scheme. Let me say that I accept that there are many families across Northern Ireland who have exceptional needs and who do require to be paid more benefit. However, my party voted for the benefit cap in the House of Commons, and we do believe that families on benefits should not be receiving more than working families. The SDLP's proposal would only increase the number of benefits which could lead to exclusions from the benefit cap, and this will lead to additional costs for the block grant because it will bring in a difference in the social security systems between here and Great Britain. For those reasons, I would urge members to reject the proposed amendment. Amendment 48 and 50, uh, and the proposal is to insert a new clause to impose a duty on the department to ensure that all claimants have access to independent advice in relation to making a claim under this Act. And I know that this is an issue which has had considerable debate and discussion. DSD has lead responsibility, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, on behalf of government for the voluntary information and advice services in Northern Ireland. Through opening doors, a strategy for the delivery of the voluntary advice services to the community, the department has already put in place arrangements to support a comprehensive, integrated quality service across Northern Ireland within a framework to ensure that services are planned and delivered in a way which matches resources to need and focusing particularly on meeting the needs of the most disadvantaged. Through opening doors, the department already invests a substantial amount of money in regards to this issue in the region of £4.5 million annually to maximise access to advice provision and ensure that independent advice is accessible and available to all, free of the point of need and target it to support the most vulnerable in our society. Over recent years, my department has developed a new approach of our funding and business relationships with the advice sector, particularly those organisations providing generous voluntary advice, which includes benefit advice. The advice sector at local level who provide generous advice services are moving to become the responsibility of local government, and, I therefore, and therefore the duty would be eventually on local councils. I have concerns that the current amendments will also place a statutory duty on local councils since they will have the responsibilities for those services. This is driven by the objectives outlined in opening doors and also influenced by a number of factors. The need to maximise the impact of our funding investment and the need for a more structured and coordinated approach to supporting those who need to access advice services. As a result, the main advice support organisations operating across Northern Ireland, Citizens Advice, the Advice NI, the Law Centre in Northern Ireland, have been contracted to work in partnership arrangements known as the Northern Ireland Advice Services Consortium. And I am conscious uh, of the potential impact of welfare reform 
and my officials are currently engaging with the Northern Ireland Advice uh, Services Consortium to discuss how we can work alongside the advice sector to best support customers through the implementation of welfare reform. And indeed, I had a meeting with the consortium, uh, I have to say, a very useful, a very uh, cordial, a very constructive conversation uh, around uh, this issue. And I think that it is right to say, going forward, that the advice consortium has a key role to play in building and supporting the capacity and the capability of frontline advice providers, securing the joined up targeted service delivery, exploring alternative funding streams, and in maximizing the impact of the substantial resources the department has invested in advice. As an immediate priority, the consortium is working uh, to develop an agreed methodology for monitoring and take up of advice services. We are also working closely with the consortium and local councils to better understand the impact of our existing investment, bringing a more robust approach to targeting and the prioritisation of support. This will pre present a key opportunity to monitor the impact of the welfare reforms and other government changes in terms of advice services and will allow government to respond in circumstances where specific need or changing demand has been identified in the evidence. This links closely with our commitment in the opening doors uh, framework to work in partnership with the advice sector and maximising access to quality services and bringing a structured approach to resourcing the sector. The department has just completed a widespread consultation with the advice sector on a new, new strategy which details the priority for the immediate future. This is real partnership working together rather than a relationship based on a statutory basis. It is important that the voluntary sector is not seen as part of government. And that, I think, is one of the issues that I have uh, around placing it on a statutory basis. Because it is vitally important for me and for, I think, this administration, that the voluntary sector is not seen to be part and parcel of government, that somehow we have a command and control mechanism in place. I think they need to retain their independence and to be seen to be independent of the executive. And placing them under a statutory provision potentially, I think, would compromise that position. But I have taken on board the concerns that have been raised by uh, the, the member, Mr. Atwood. We have had a discussion in relation to this, and I have given, uh, I trust, a sufficient assurance that, and it has been raised by other members, but I, I trust that I've given a sufficient assurance that the needs and the structure and the delivery of independent advice is uh, met, is secured in a way that people have confidence in it. And the question that I suppose re uh, is raised in my mind is that what is the current problems that we have that are so uh, pressing that it has led to a requirement for the demand for it to be placed on a statutory basis. If, if members were coming to, to me and saying, here are the list of huge problems, huge difficulties, and you're not, your department hasn't given us a penny. And I, I, I listened to the comments that were made by the member for East Belfast in relation to the amount of money that goes into that particular area. And I pay credit, and I pay uh, in the House today, uh, I commend the organisations in East Belfast that have drawn down huge amounts of money into their community. And that can be replicated across many other parts of Northern Ireland. And so the £4.5 million pounds that my department gives to the independent advice sector, I believe, is having an effect. Can we do more? Can we do it better? I think that that's why the work that we are continuing to do with the sector, and I give a commitment to continue to work with that sector, will uh, intensify. But I don't believe at this minute in time that we uh, are 
in need of a, a legislative framework which could create difficulties. And, I have to say, and this is another point, could lead to significant increase in the costs of the provision of that service. And I think that that would be an issue we would have to be very careful about. Let's remember there are many out there who like to make industries of certain things. I think that hasn't happened in terms of the advice sector as it's currently constructed because it has been a voluntary, it has been a partnership between government and those organisations. And I think that if we place it on a statutory basis in terms of legislation, we could run ourselves into more challenging times. So for those reasons, I would urge members to reject those amendments. Turning to amendment, yes. I would suggest to the member that the argument that somehow created a statutory right to advice captures the advice sector in government is not the best of argument. People, citizens, have the right to independent legal advice if they're arrested. I'm sure nobody's suggesting that David Ford has somehow captured the legal profession when it comes to their act act actions, given events of recent days and months. Are you minded at all, Minister, to, given your forthcoming, given your forthright remarks in this matter, to consider a further amendment at further consideration stage? What I will say to the member is that I will give consideration to the comments that have been made, are already made to me and that between now and further consideration stage I will give uh, con uh, further uh, consideration to this particular issue. I have already alluded to uh, the uh, elements that I will bring further amendments to uh, the, the bill in regards to further consideration stage. I think that that will require us to having discussions in a, in a way which tries to tease out not only the issue but the benefits of doing a particular uh, amendment. So uh, I will take the comment that's uh, been put to me, I will take it on board and uh, I will have further uh, reflection on the issue uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Turning to uh, the issue of, I think it's Amendment 51. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have now moved and changed from Deputy Principal Speaker. Amendment 51 uh, introduces Clause 130A, which provides for discretionary support assistance replacing elements of what is currently the Social Fund. Yes. Uh, Thank you, uh, Minister, for giving me. It was just to maybe clarify, because I alluded to this last night, the discretionary support will replace the Social Fund. Uh, essentially, which is um, in Britain has been abolished. It's gone to local councils, and there's all sorts of difficulties with that. And without preempting uh, and moving on to um, Amendment 52 um, about the social fund, uh, or sorry, the discretionary commissioner, Mr. Agnew seemed to suggest that this was some sort of a quango that was being set up. Now, um, maybe he, he didn't grasp the significance of that because. The Social Fund Commissioner was independent, a very important part of the process in ensuring that the most vulnerable had access to community care grants and, in some cases, um, budget loans, etc., where the local office had turned it down. The Social Fund inspectors did a very good job. It seems to me that that particular role will replace a very important post and give an independent dimension to the discretionary support where people, and also I would, I would uh, say, and you can agree, Minister, if you want, that the discretionary support will also include people on in low income, which is an innovative step as far as we are concerned. I, I thank the member, and, uh, and I also want to say, and I was waiting the opportunity to reply to uh, Mr. Agnew on the issue because he made some other comments which I will be quite happy to address. But the member is absolutely right in relation to the Social Fund uh, and the, the Office of the Social Fund Commissioner. Uh, what we're simply doing is replacing what was already there. It's not the creation of a new position. But uh, I will deal with that issue because I want to make a few comments about some of the quangos that are acting disgracefully in Northern Ireland at the minute. Uh, so we will come to that. But can I also say, and I want to say this to, to the member, to say a word of thanks and appreciation to him for the work 
that he has done because he will, uh, if uh, depending on the outcome of what happens on the 7th of May, uh, he may uh, be leaving uh, this house uh, and going, I hope to take up his seat uh, in uh, the House of Commons. Uh, but that's an issue for him and for his colleagues. But uh, he has made a contribution to the committee in terms of his knowledge of many of the things that we are discussing and over many years uh, knew what it was to work with people on a day-to-day -day basis and, and I think that knowledge was uh, clearly seen in the work that he carried out uh, when the committee was doing uh, its work and scrutinising the policy coming from my department which uh, is something that I would like to see them return to as quickly as possible. However, moving on to uh, the issues in relation to Amendment 51, uh, and it is the, the clause 130A, which provides for the discretionary support assistant replacing elements of what is currently the social fund. And I will explain in a moment how this clause is intended to be used, but firstly, I should like to set out some of the broader context and the rationale for these changes. Again, I know this is, can become laborious, but I think it's important uh, that when we have comment out in the public domain, which is sometimes ill-informed, ill-advised and inaccurate, I think it's important that we lay in this House, which has the responsibility for the legislation, uh, we lay in this House what are the facts in regards to these things. I know it will not stop uh, some people. You never let truth get in the way of a good story, but uh, that's an issue that they have to uh, deal with. In Northern Ireland, the need for immediate support to those facing emergency financial situations is already higher than in any other part of the United Kingdom. And I know that from even my own constituency, uh, where there are particular uh, issues and there are particular times when you can see uh, a rise in uh, the demand for the services currently provided for uh, under the social fund as it, as it currently exists. And this is due to a combination of factors, but primarily because of the higher levels of people here who live in poverty. In comparison to the United Kingdom as a whole, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland also has a persistently higher proportion of people concentrated just above the poverty line and who are at risk of falling into poverty. It is not only those people relying on benefits who find themselves needing help to relieve emergency situations. Figures show that in Northern Ireland, over two-fifths of individuals living in low-income households are part of a family where at least one adult is either in full-time or part-time work. For all these low-income groups, the likelihood of continued reliance on temporary support in emergency situations is expected to continue, if not to increase. There are also serious consequences for greater and longer-term costs to public service if an effective response to immediate need is not available. There are very real risks in terms of long-term health and social care costs and consequences where the interests of households with children are threatened or where individuals are left without the fundamentals such as food, clothing, heat and housing. In the past, a greater element of discretionary support has been delivered through the social fund in the form of community care grants, crisis loans for living expenses and household items and budgeting loans as part of the social security system. The proposed repeal of certain social fund services will mean the removal of community care grants and crisis loans for living expenses and household items from this system and has prompted the department to develop a new provision for Northern Ireland. The objectives of the new provision are to alleviate the most exceptional extreme or crisis situations which present significant risk to health, safety or well-being of low-income and vulnerable households through the provision of practical support, ensure that those facing the most extreme hardship as a result of the adjustment to the changes to the social security regime are supported in their efforts towards self-dependency where access to discretionary support would avoid or reduce major risk or life-threatening circumstances. And thirdly, maximize the effectiveness 
of discretionary support by ensuring that people in such circumstances have timely and appropriate access to and support from the range of government funded general uh, and sp specialist information and advice services in order to maximise the risk of reoccurrence, support greater self-reliance and independence and improve social and financial inclusion. Responding to such need will require a new provision which is responsible, responsive, flexible and which ensures a rapid and an effective response to the most immediate needs through the provision of a range of interventions in order to relieve immediate need, support and facilitate greater self-reliance and promote and support personal responsibility. Collaboration with other statutory services to ensure a proper assessment of individual need will also be required. The new provision, therefore, uh, Mr. Speaker, has been designed to ensure support is properly targeted to address the highest priority need of those on low income. It will not replicate the social fund, but it will reflect its strengths in terms of ensuring a speedy response to emergency or crisis situations, including its local accessibility. Its flexibility in meeting a wide variety of needs and its independent review mechanisms. Social Security Agency is designing the new provision, uh, has used a number of key design principles which emerged from phase one of the Social Fund Research Study. These have been endorsed by the Social Development Committee, and I know that they spent some time in regards to this particular issue. The new provisions response to immediate need as experienced by low-income and vulnerable individuals and or households will, al will also allow for a range of practical interventions. These will include the direct provision of financial awards, primarily through interest-free repayable loans. However, the provision of non-repayable grants will remain as an important element of support in the most extreme cases. Other interventions may, however, include either directly or through third parties, the provision of goods and services. This may include essential equipment to relieve immediate household needs. An important aspect of the new provision is the recognition that those finding themselves in the most extreme financial emergencies can also benefit from readily available specialist advice and information provided by the range of government and community providers. Referral to such advice with the customer's consent will form an important element of the discretionary support provision. Encouraging independence through effective use of discretionary support is an important part of the new provisions, and it is a vital element in building a stronger economy and tackling poverty and disadvantage. Discretionary support is about supporting people, protecting the vulnerable appropriately, but also encouraging self-efficiency. I would urge members to accept Amendment 51. Turning then, Mr. Speaker, to uh, the Amendment 52, which introduces the new clause 130B, which defines the, re the recruitment role and responsibilities of the discretionary support commissioner and their staff. And I would ask Mr. Agnew, to, uh, as I, I trust he is, paying attention to this particular element, and that will rectify, I think, a, a, a comment that he made earlier. An important aspect of the discretionary support provision is the need for an independent review mechanism of decisions. Under Social Fund, this independent review service is provided currently by the Office of the Social Fund Commissioner for Northern Ireland. This will be replaced by the Office of the Discretionary Support Commissioner. The rules for this new independent external review will be similar to the current review process under the Social Fund. So rather than us endorsing a new quango, we are replacing what is already there. I have to say, on the basis of what I have seen some of the quangos in Northern Ireland yes. recently, for example, the Equality Commission doing, I would love to be in a position to ensure that they were curtailed in the way in which yeah. they do their business. And of course, we had the charade in this house the other day when there was a member who tried to give the impression as though he was taking 
the Equality Commission on. But then, of course, we all know now that when the appropriate amendment should have been placed in terms of the budget process, that wasn't done. So we've had a lot of people who want to uh, seem to give the impression as though they are really taking these things on. But in reality, they are only, again, trying to placate their own position and present a narrative which they know themselves is not the case. So, in terms of the quangos, in terms of us, and I noticed that the member said he will remind us when we uh, say that uh, we want to reduce the overall number of quangos, he'll come back to this point and he'll tell the DUP and he'll tell me, well, you created a new quango. The reality is we are replacing what is already there. And you've heard from the member opposite. If we weren't to do this, there would be a call, and rightly so, from members in this House, how are we going to deal with this issue? How are we going to address these particular concerns? So I, I will give way when I'm finished. However, I think that it is very clear that what we are doing here is replacing what already exists. No more, no less. I, I thank the Minister for giving way. And I was clear that I have no problem with the, the proposed commission. Um, it is not me or my party that, that uh, is so critical of our existing commissions. He said this is simply replacing what's already there. Is he therefore saying that it will exist within the same footprint, i.e. there will be no greater costs? You know, sometimes you do wonder about where some members come from in terms of these things. The rules for this new independent external review will be similar to the current review process under the Social Fund. I would assume that the issue uh, will be the same when it comes to the way in which it is funded. But what I will do, so that there is clarity for the member, I will uh, give the member further information in relation to the cost. And then that will, I trust, be of help and benefit to him, because I don't have that information in front of me, and there's no point in me trying to bluff my way out of it. That's the reality, and that's where, that's where we're at. Can I turn, Mr. Uh, speaker then to Amendment 73, which proposes the removal of the ability to treat a person as having a prescribed level of income. Let me explain why we would want to treat a person as having a prescribed level of income. Universal credit will provide support for people who are self-employed only where self-employment is the best route for them to become financially self-sufficient. Safeguard is being built in so that universal credit does not end up subsidising people undertaking unprofitable activities. This safeguard will be in the form of a minimum income floor. The minimum income floor will set a minimal level of assumed income from self-employment. The minimum income floor is designed to provide a fair incentive for the self-employed to increase their earnings and productivity and realise their financial potential. The earnings expectation of self-employed claimants under universal credit mirror, mirror those expected uh, of claimants with similar circumstances in employed uh, work. For example, the level of the minimum income floor for claimants expected to be able to work full-time will be the equivalent to 35 hours per week at the national minimum wage. It is right that universal credit should support people to be self-employed, but only insofar as self-employment is the best route for them to become financially self-sufficient. If claimants are within one year of starting, up, uh, or, or starting out in self-employed activity, they will be eligible for a start-up period. This will mean that newly self-employed claimants will be exempt from reaching the minimum income floor of a period of one year and their universal credit payments will be calculated according to their actual income rather than assumed income. This is a one start-up period for the self-employment of 12 months every five years where the claimant has ceased the previous activity and started a new business. Further, when we migrate people over to universal credit who are already running their own businesses, we will provide a similar six-month grace period before they need to make any adjustments under universal credit. If Amendment 73 was accepted, 
This would mean that there would be no incentive for those self-employed on low income to increase their earnings through developing their self-employment. The minimum income floor will assume a level of income of self -employed, uh, for self-employed bases uh, on the earnings or based on the earnings we expect a claimant with similar circumstances in employment to achieve. For these reasons, I would urge members to reject Amendment 73. Turning to Amendment 75, which removes paragraph 7 of Schedule 1, this paragraph gives the Department the power to make regulations specifying the work-related requirements for claimants who are asserting a right to reside in the United Kingdom on the basis that they are EU job seekers under EU treaties. By way of background, I should explain that people coming to the United Kingdom from EU countries do not have unrestricted access to UK social security benefits and tax credits. Since 2004, access to most benefits for EU nationals has depended on whether they have a right to reside here. And for most benefits, the right to reside requirement is part of the habitual residence test. Having a right to reside does not simply mean that a person can live in a particular country. Broadly speaking, a person who moves from one EU country to another has a right to reside if they are economically active or are able to support themselves. This means that not all EU nationals will have a right to reside, even though they can exercise free movement rights. For example, migrants moving from one country to another claiming benefits. Only certain categories of persons moving within the EU will have certain guaranteed rights attached to their residence in the host country. This is what is meant by EU nationals having a right to reside. Since 2006, all EU nationals have a right to reside in the UK for three months without the requirement to be financially self-sufficient. However, access to benefits during this three-month period will not satisfy the right to re the reside test. Those who have a right to of residence after the initial three-month period include workers or self-employed persons and their families, and students and their families, provided they can support themselves. EU nationals may also have a right to reside straight away as a job seeker if they can show that they are looking for work and have a genuine chance of being engaged. Family members of job seekers also have a right to reside. To have a right to reside as a job seeker, a person needs to be registered with the Jobs and Benefit Office, Social Security Office, and signing on as an individual for and seeking work. Sorry, I said signing on as an individual. Signing on as available for work and seeking work. A person with a right to reside as a job seeker may claim income-related job seekers allowance, which can give them entitled to housing benefit. Although the power itself under Schedule 1, Paragraph 7 is quite wide, we only wish to exercise it in relation to EU job seekers. We do not intend to exercise the power in relation to EU self-employed, and in relation to EU workers, we only intend to exercise it in relation to those who retain worker status because they become involuntary unemployed and therefore need to seek employment to continue to retain their workers status. The regulations will enable us to check that an EU job seeker is in fact searching for work and available for work and that they therefore continue to meet the right to reside test. If someone claims to be an EU job seeker without actually search, uh, searching for work, they will no longer satisfy the right to reside test. An EU claimant who does not have the right to reside will not be eligible for universal credit. This is because universal credit is treated as a social assistance and is not payable to EU nationals without a right to reside. The crucial point is that we are only exercising the power to enable us to check whether an EU claimant continues to enjoy a right to reside as a job seeker. Without the power to ver verify whether a claimant is seeking work, we would be unable to verify whether they continue to have a right to reside under EU law. While we have a legal duty to provide support to people who come to Northern Ireland in line with national and international obligations, it is also necessary to protect the taxpayer and the benefit system. There is a need to make sure that the rules which apply when people from outside come do not allow them to take inappropriate advantage 
of the benefit system. And I think that members would uh, understand and appreciate that that is the issue. Without this provision in the bill, the department would be unable to check if an EU national with uh, work status meets the right to reside test. To accept Amendment 75 would be a clear breach of parity. There would be potential implications for the Northern Ireland Bloc grant, and it would result in EU claimants in Northern Ireland being subject to preferential treatment compared to EU claimants in Great Britain. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think that uh, I have tried to cover uh, most of the issues that were even raised uh, by the members in terms of the uh, issues that are raised. I just want them, the members not in his place, uh, but it was an issue that was raised by uh, Mr. Little, uh, and he raised the issue in regards to uh, the uh, victims uh, and survivors. And uh, I did, I trust, uh, at some length yesterday in the House, seek to give reassurances in that issue. And uh, if the member, when he sees this being referred to in this debate, will be able to reference my comments in regards to that issue in uh, Hansard. Uh, I therefore, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, draw my remarks to a conclusion in relation to Group 2 of these amendments. Thank you, Minister. And as there is no formal suspension agreed by the Business Committee for uh, lunch, I propose by leave of the House to suspend the proceedings at this point. The sitting is suspended until 2 p.m. When the next member to speak will be the Chairperson of the Committee for Social Development, Mr Alec Maskey, to wind. Thank you.